G'day mates, it's Bee Buster here, and I would like to give Surfshark a big shout out for sponsoring this episode. In an ocean of online content, there's a lot of websites that take your info without you even knowing it. But you too can swim under the radar by using Surfshark VP. So Surfshark is a modern VPN designed with the user in mind. Their utilities are powered by robust security mechanisms, but designed to be simple and intuitive to use. You can enjoy all the freedoms of an open internet safely and anonymously. As you guys are probably well aware of too, internet security and freedom is a hot topic these days, and in my opinion, both are incredibly important, especially for any of you guys in Europe who have Article 13 taking effect soon. I don't know if you guys remember too, but it wasn't that long ago that our mine was able to hack my YouTube channel, and I was really worried for some time about having my information shared on the internet. And so I recently signed up to Surfshark for internet security myself, and I must admit that I really appreciated just how easy it was to set up. I also love the fact that with Surfshark running, I can surf the web with no ads, trackers, malware, and phishing attempts. You can also connect an unlimited amount of devices, which was great for my own house where I have like 200 separate devices. And one of the best things too is that there's also a 30 day money back guarantee. So all you have to do guys is use the promo code SCARED to get 85% off plus 3 extra months for free. And as I mentioned, Surfshark offers a 30 day money back guarantee, so there's absolutely no risk. Surf with your own set of rules. And as always, the link is in the description. It was a long time ago before cell phones were prevalent, and I was a female in my early 30s who had just driven our kids to the pediatrician. The Macon Guard doctor's office was an hour away from our home, and I was just taking the two youngest of my three, then ages one and three years old, to our scheduled appointment. Because we lived so far away, their office always gave us the last appointment of the day, and we were very grateful for it. The doctor had just built a new building off of a fresh spur of the highway, so the location was quite isolated in every direction, but a very nice facility compared to his old spot by the hospital there. His new building was also pretty far back on the new lot, and my car, a black Jeep Cherokee that we had owned for like two years, was one of only four or five cars in the parking lot when we got there. I parked near the front door, removed the kids from their car seats, and for the next hour or so we just waited, saw the doctor, we paid, and then we exited back outside. As I loaded the children in their car seats, the receptionist locked the glass doors, but when I tried to start the car, it just wouldn't turn over. Gathering the children again, I knocked on the door until someone followed us back in and asked to borrow the phone to call a nearby garage for service. I found one in the phone book and the man said that he would come but it might be a bit so I told him my location, left to go back out to the car, rolled down all the windows and loaded the children back into their seats as we just sat there and waited. Soon we watched as all the lights were turned down in the building again and everybody left, leaving us alone in the parking lot. As it was still light, I spent a lot of that time trying to tend to the children, digging through our car for snacks and a bottle, making sure that they weren't getting too hot, etc. Although the service station attendant said that it was probably going to be quite a while, I was pleasantly surprised when a truck pulled into the empty parking lot pretty soon, and a man got out of his pickup, smiled and nodded to me, and said that he was going to raise the hood. He was uh, middle-aged, a bit scruffy, but... Quite frankly, many gas station attendants sometimes look that way, especially at the end of the day, and I was just grateful when he began doing something under the hood almost immediately. I sat down again in the driver's seat with the door open, waiting for him to tell me to try the engine, but he seemed to be taking a long time, checking the connections and whatnot, and I longed for him to just grab jumper cables, but he just never did. Without getting out of the car, I asked him what he thought was wrong, and he said, Oh, uh, I think it's just loose wires, not the battery, and continued whatever he was doing. I couldn't really see his face at all from where I was sitting, but his hands were visible through that long horizontal slit between the windshield and the raised hood as we waited. 
More than once, he said that it was merely a loose wire, and if I would just come up really quick, he would show me which one it was, so it would never happen again. I remember kind of laughing it off, though, and saying that sadly there was no reason to show me anything, as I didn't know anything about cars. I just thanked him and continued to stay in the driver's seat, again just waiting for the inevitable sign to try and start the ignition that was most surely coming any moment. At one point, I remember distinctly thinking, too, that he was flirting with me, but I was trying above all to be polite and kind as he was helping us out. We were hot and tired and sort of miserable, and truthfully, most of my attention was on the children, and so I was very distracted as well. Oddly enough, he was starting to sound a little frustrated with me because I wouldn't come up and look at the engine. I remember thinking that I really didn't want to make him so mad that he would just leave us there all alone, with the sun sinking so quickly. And then, the strangest thing happened. Another truck suddenly pulled in that desolate parking lot, and as it did, this nice guy working underneath my hood suddenly slammed it shut, ran to his truck, started it, and drove away really quickly, without even saying a word of goodbye or anything. Needless to say, I was both confused and a little bit anxious when he did this because I didn't know who was now arriving. I even remember feeling a little bit frightened that he suddenly left me there alone with two little ones, defenseless. Why wouldn't he at least stay and speak to whoever was parking next to me now? It certainly seemed the southerly gentleman thing to do at least. I looked around and was very aware once again that there was no visible cars on the road, no homes or businesses were nearby, and the sun was continuing to set quickly. As this new pickup pulled up next to me, I got out of the car once again, apprehensively this time. Upon exiting, though, he immediately introduced himself, and his name and his voice seemed to match who I had spoken to on the phone much earlier. He then actually called me by name, apologized for being so late, and finally smiled and stared towards the road, asking who that man was that had just left so suddenly. Relieved and unfazed, I just laughed and told him, Well, I don't know. I thought all this time that he was you. And we both just laughed as he then grabbed jumper cables, walked to the front of my car, raised the hood and started to hook up the battery terminals quickly. I immediately sat back in the driver's seat once more, suddenly grateful that, with luck, that air conditioner would be blowing full blast shortly and once again checking on the children. While listening for the familiar words try it, I had my back turned towards the children when he surprised me by suddenly walking to the driver's side door. And in the strangest voice he said, Um, ma'am, is this yours? And when I looked into his hands, he was holding a, a long, thin, dagger-like device that was about a foot and a half in length. It appeared to be very old and covered with reddish dust, yet one end of it had tiny small finger holes as if it was a mix of a long, thin sword and scissors combined. I remember being amazed, but not immediately frightened, and I asked where he found it. Uh, it was under the hood, he replied. I said, just matter-of-factly, that I'd never seen them before, but how weird was it that those things had somehow been stuck and undiscovered in my car for all those years? I remember thinking that it was rather funny, shaking my head and even smiling a bit. But he continued to stare at me, unbelievingly, and he looked oddly pale too, like he couldn't find the words to speak for a bit, just staring at this bizarrely long, thin, sword-like object still within his hands. Honestly though, I didn't care one bit about it. All I could think of was getting the car going, letting me pay him, and the cost obviously, and then just leaving. He didn't say anything else after that, just quickly set them on the curb, started his truck and then signaled for me to start the jeep, and when it immediately caught, my three-year-old cheered. Grateful, I quickly turned on the air conditioner full blast, rolled up all the windows, aimed the air vents back towards the back seat, and reached for my purse to pay out. I stood up and took a few steps to meet him so I could hear the amount now owed with both our vehicles running, he came back around to my driver's side and, instead of handing me the bill, irritated me a bit by walking right past me and picking up that weird object once more. Hey ma'am, he said, sort of slowly, 
I want you to look at this just one more time and held him out for closer inspection. This time I moved a bit closer and I actually really looked at it. In his hands, even though he was a really big guy, the item appeared incredibly long and thin. It almost had a, a bayonet looking quality, except for the strangely small two loops on one end. As he held it, he spoke quietly and slowly to me, trying desperately to make me understand something that apparently was still going over my head. Ma'am, these weren't hidden somewhere in the engine. They hadn't been there very long at all, in fact, because they were sitting right on top. They must have just been put there, in fact. I shook my head no and smiled, as I said. But they're obviously very old and rusty. To which, he pointed more closely and replied, Yeah, but see how sharp they are? These look like they've just been sharpened, in fact. And when I looked down, he was right. I don't know why I hadn't noticed it before. The length was certainly long and dagger-like, but the sharpness was undeniably the most frightening quality. As I paid him, his final words to me were, Ma'am, I don't know what was about to happen here, but I'm sure glad that I pulled up when I did. He quietly thanked me when taking the payment, told me that I needed to call the police whenever I got home safely, and then asked me where I wanted the item. I didn't want to touch it, so I released the back window and he placed it inside. We both then left the lot together, him turning one way, me turning the other towards the small highway that would lead home, still an hour away. I did indeed contact the police the moment that we arrived home and I got the children inside safely, but although they listened politely, they declined when I offered to bring the scissor-like thing to them. The officer that I spoke to said that they sounded as if they were specialized surgical shears from my description and measurements on the phone, which I must admit that I found quite disturbing, as you can imagine. I had actually tried to be really careful not to touch any of the surfaces, hoping that they might be able to do fingerprints or test the surface for blood or something, but they just really didn't seem interested. The officer simply told me that it sounded as if I was very lucky and that I might want to keep the shears for a few days, just in case someone from his office got back with me later. But that was pretty much it. I wrapped them carefully in newspaper, and then I placed them in the brick storage unit behind our house, and they remained there for several more years, untouched, until we finally moved away and threw them in the trash. But here's the creepy part. So around that time, if you were to look through the newspapers... Women were going missing in Georgia, some never to be found as well. And of course, all these years later, it's still happening. I have often wondered too what would have happened if the service station attendant didn't arrive when he did. If my children would still have a mother. If I would still have my son and my daughter. If I would have missed all these years with them. I guess that I may never know, but I did learn something about myself that day. I always felt that I was pretty aware of my surroundings, pretty good at reading circumstances and staying safe. But because I was exhausted and tired and hot and stranded in a different city, my common sense and my intelligence just simply left me for a bit and just wasn't working at the time. And many of my friends and my family still think that it could have cost us our lives that day. I was camping in the middle of nowhere in Washington near Mount Rainier, like not an official campground, just way out in the forest where I wouldn't have expected another human for miles. One night I wake up and hear something, open my tent and there is a guy sitting by where my fire had been, right outside of my tent. Nothing particularly noteworthy about the guy, just a fairly regular looking dude just sitting there a couple of feet from my tent. No bag or pack or anything with him, just a guy. He saw me open my tent, his eyes got huge like he had just seen a ghost, and he took off. It shook me up pretty badly, but over the next day I managed to put it out of my mind fairly well after writing it off as just some odd occurrence and a guy that was probably high or something and had somehow managed to set up a camp coincidentally not far from mine. Then, two days after that, 
and 10 or 15 miles away in a totally random direction that nobody could take the same path as on accident. I was sitting by the fire that night and started hearing noises that I got more and more convinced were a person. I called out to them and out of the darkness someone was like, Do you know how to get to Bell's Canyon? I said no, I don't even think that's really a place there. They kept talking from just out of my line of vision. I tried to see them with my flashlight but they yelled, aim that away, and kind of spooked and not wanting to piss off a potentially crazy person, I did. After like 15 minutes of me being very freaked out and them talking and asking completely random questions from the darkness, it sounded like the voice had gotten closer so I shined my light that way again and it was the same dude who had been outside my tent two nights before. Now, he had to have followed me almost 15 miles over two days because there's just no way he could have just accidentally wound up in the same spot as vast as that wilderness is. There's just no possible way. And as soon as my light hit him again, he took off. I started to chase him this time, but didn't want to get lost in the wilderness, in the dark too, so stopped quickly after probably only 100 or 200 feet. But this one definitely couldn't be written off because the only way that he could have been in both places is specifically if he was following me. I decided the trip was very over first thing in the morning at this point and hiked back out over three days, constantly doubling back, trying to throw anyone following off my trail and occasionally hiding and waiting to see if he would come by following me again. I really can't describe just how terrifying it was to feel like I was being hunted through the woods and to actually have to brainstorm on things I could do to best avoid potentially being murdered. On the first night of hiking out, twice I had heard what sounded like a person walking circles outside of my tent, but by the time that I mustered the courage to look, nobody was there. On the second night, I could have sworn I heard what I thought was an animal making noises at first in the distance, but slowly decided that it sounded more like a human making animal calls, but it could have actually been an animal. I didn't actually see the guy again at that stage. But it really sounded like a person making howling noises and I literally almost cried when I finally got back to my car. The relief was so strong. To this day, it's probably the most terrifying experience that I've ever had. I have no idea who the guy was or what his intentions were and no way of getting an explanation, but, but I really can't articulate just what a terrifying few days it was. So this story is from my past and happened about 32 years ago in East Texas. My mom and dad divorced when I was 16 years old and my brothers and I lived with my mom. My dad visited us once in a while but not really on a consistent basis. He was a gambler one of the reasons my parents split up in the first place, and tended not to come around when he was broke. But on the rare occasion that he won big, he would visit and spend money on us and then disappear again. My dad said that he had a job as a shuttle driver for a local hotel. He told my brothers and me that the shuttle driving was just a cover, that he actually worked for organized crime, which he claimed owned the hotel or something. He said that his real job was to drive out to various places in the area to pick up fugitives running from warrants or otherwise wanted by law enforcement, bring them to the hotel to hide and then later they would move on by means my dad said that he didn't know about. Now my dad was always a blowhard and always exaggerating or out and out lying so my brothers and I just sort of blew it off and didn't think much of the claim. Until... Something strange happened. My dad, he disappeared. It was 1988 and I was 22 years old and a college student still living at home. I worked as a full-time disc jockey on the overnight shift, 10pm to 7am, at a local radio station. My middle brother was 19 years old, lived in an apartment with a friend and worked at a nearby Dairy Queen. My youngest brother was 9 and lived at home. Now one day, my brother called my mum and me and asked us if we knew where my dad was. And he says that some men apparently came to the Dairy Queen while he was at work and asked him if he'd seen my dad recently. 
My brother truthfully told them too that he hadn't seen or heard from my dad in months and that he just often does that, cuts off contact for months at a time. My brother said that these men didn't say who they were but seemed satisfied and then left. My brother wondered if these men or anyone had called to talk to us and ask us where my dad was. But we also had not heard from my dad in months. The following day, my brother says the men returned to his work, and this time they flashed badges and claimed to be FBI agents. He says that they were very aggressive and demanded that my brother tell them where my dad was. My brother kept insisting, truthfully, that he didn't know where my dad was, that the last that he heard, he worked at a local hotel as a shuttle driver. But the experience definitely upset him, and he called my mum and me again. Upset, my mum called the hotel where my dad worked. The man that she spoke to said that my dad had disappeared weeks ago and he had no idea where he went. The following day, my brother was at work when his roommate called and said that someone had apparently been in their apartment. The roommate claimed that when he got home from work, he found the sliding glass door open and the place was completely ransacked but nothing appeared to be missing. My brother, very upset obviously, went to his apartment and found that, in fact, his address book was missing from the breakfast nook, and also a teddy bear that he recently bought for his son, and a photo of his son too, were missing from his bedroom. Now, my brother and my mum and I were pretty much beside ourselves with anger and fear and paranoia, so we went to the local FBI office to complain that the FBI had done this, and to tell them, once and for all, my brother does not know where my dad is. Well, as you may have guessed, the FBI claimed no knowledge of the event and claimed that they were not looking for my dad. They also said that none of their agents had contacted my brother. Furthermore, when my mother told them my dad had claimed that he worked for organized crime, the FBI would neither confirm nor deny that the hotel had ties to organized crime or that there was an investigation going on. My mum called the hotel again and told the manager that men were looking for my dad, that they were terrorizing my brother and flat out asked the guy if there was any truth to my dad's claim to be working for organized crime. The man laughed and told her, Lady, there's no such thing as the mafia, okay? While we were trying to make sense of all of these weird details, we kept wondering why my brother was being harassed, but not my mother or me. And that was when I was reminded of a, a really weird event that happened to me about two or three weeks prior. But because I worked overnight, I was often wide awake in the middle of the night on my days off with nothing to do. But one night, I went to the local cable TV company where my friend worked as a computer system operator just to hang out with him for a few hours and BS a little bit. And at about 3.30 in the morning, I think, he had a big computer job to do, so it was pretty much time for me to go home, so I left. As soon as I pulled out from his company's driveway, though, a car was immediately behind me, sort of tailgating me. I mean... He was on me so quickly it scared the crap out of me, in fact. The car just seemed to appear out of nowhere. He also had his high beams on and was blinding me and I couldn't make out anything about the car behind me. I couldn't see inside to see how many people were in the car, or what they looked like, or pretty much anything. I couldn't even see what kind of car it was, in fact. So I changed lanes to let the tailgater pass, but he changed lanes with me. I moved again and he moved again. He was tailgating me and blinding me and now seemed to be following me too. I stopped at the intersection and I got in the left turning lane with my signal on and he got behind me again. Since there was no other traffic at all anywhere around, when the light changed I zoomed across the intersection, streaked across all the lanes of the traffic into the far right lane and went through the intersection trying to lose him and he followed me. Now though, it was absolutely clear that he was for sure following me. I cut into the nearby neighborhood and tried to lose him, but he kept following me anyway. I finally managed to zoom back out to the intersection, and I crossed over and went to the 7-Eleven at the corner, and jumped out and ran inside and yelled at the clerk that somebody was following me. 
As I did, I saw the car that was following me cut through the parking lot of the 7-Eleven. And for the first time, I finally got a good look at the car. It was a, a late model tan colored four door and there were two white guys in it. The clerk just blew me off and said that I was exaggerating, that it was probably just kids messing with me and to let it go. I left but I was very spooked by it and didn't want to go straight home for that reason. I was afraid that they might follow me and I didn't want them to know where I lived so I just went back to my workplace. I knew that the disc jockey on the air that night would be my friend Paula, so I decided to go and visit her on the air for a little while and hang out and calm down. I told her what happened and hung out for about two hours. She also felt like it was probably just some punks being jerks or something, and that honestly calmed me down a bit. But when I got home, now over two hours since the car harassed me, that same car was now at my house. As I was coming down the street to my apartment and about to turn right, I saw the damn car pull out of my apartment and as it passed me, these guys flashed their high beams on and off at me again. It definitely was them too. I panicked and I called Paula at the radio station and told her what happened. She was freaked too. She was like, oh my goodness, why would they wait for you at your home? Who is this? Call the police quickly. I was freaked out as to how they could possibly know where I lived in the first place, why they would wait for two hours for me, and then when they finally saw me, flash their lights at me and just leave. I mean, why would people do that? But now, remembering that event and putting it together with my brother's FBI visit and apartment break-in, it seemed obvious that all of this was tied together. I hadn't thought about it before, but now I remembered... My car was actually my dad's car. He gave it to me about two months earlier when he got a new one, so if someone had been looking for my dad, they might have thought that I was him, and when they saw me coming home, realized that I'm not him, and then they just left. But who was messing with us, and why? Where was my dad? Why are these strange people harassing us? My mum and my brother and I went to the local police station and we filed a missing persons report and a complaint too. We spoke to a very nice detective and about five days later we got a call from that detective because he had apparently solved the whole strange case. It turns out that my dad disappeared because he apparently owed his employers more than $50,000 in gambling debts. The detective confirmed that my dad did work for some unsavory characters, as he put it, but said that they weren't organized crime per se. He had no idea if my dad was shuttling fugitives or not, but he said that my dad was hiding out in Nevada somewhere and that he had spoken to him and he was alive and well, but in hiding. We asked, though, then, who the heck were those men and why were they bothering my brother like that? The detective explained that... It's not that uncommon for unsavory bounty hunters and debt collectors to impersonate law enforcement and call and even harass people at times. My brother asked, how did they get into his apartment? The detective said that a sliding glass door is actually pretty easy to open and they probably stole the address book hoping that it had my dad's contact information in it. They stole the teddy bear and the pictures to use to scare my brother, which obviously worked. I asked the detective why the man only harassed my brother and not my mum and me. The detective then said, because my dad had apparently used my brother as a reference on his job application at the hotel and gave my brother's address and phone number. The FBI agents probably figured that he was close to my dad and either maintained contact with him or, if threatened, would at least contact him. So, in the end, my dad eventually turned back up in town and acted like nothing had ever happened. He never actually spoke of the incident, and we never brought it back up. I guess that he got the money that he owed back to them, but to be honest, I, I don't know for sure. But anyway, that's my story, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. So I had never heard of shadow people before and I had no idea what to call what I saw 
but one day I had the idea to type Shadow Hatman into a search engine and what I saw just shook me to my very core. I then read about countless encounters with the entity, but none were like mine. All were, it was night and I saw it in the hall, or it was night and blah blah blah, but not me. What I saw happened in broad daylight and only a couple of feet in front of me. Here I am 17 years later, and it still gives me the creeps. So like I said, I was 12 or 13. It was a Saturday morning and not a school day, so I slept in until 9.30.10. I woke up and had my breakfast with my mum and my dad. They got into a huge fight. Then they went into their bedroom on the other side of the house to argue. I watched some cartoons and then around 11am I think I decided to go and brush my teeth. Now when you walk into my bathroom the sink is about two feet in right in front of the doorway. So I enter and I start brushing. There's also a big mirror but I didn't initially see anything behind me in it. Then I finish brushing my teeth and I just get this sudden sinking feeling that somebody is standing behind me. But I knew that my parents were still arguing in their room and still saw nothing in the mirror. But I remember the fear I felt turning around. And then there it was standing right outside the doorway, broad daylight, about two or three feet in front of me. And man, it was tall. It would have had to have crouched to enter the bathroom, in fact. It was completely dark and shadowy, except it had these horrifying sort of glowing red eyes. It stood there for a good second, just staring at me. I opened my mouth to scream, but no sound came out. I still have nightmares to this day of something bad happening and trying to scream but no sound coming out. And then it reached out its hand towards me, fingers pointing outward, long skinny and dark fingers. And you know, now that I think about it, it kind of reminds me of a Dementor from Harry Potter. Then with its outstretched hand, it took a step towards me. Frozen in fear, I remember thinking, this is it. I think my life is about to be over. Then, after taking another step towards me with its outstretched hand, it just vanished, gone, right before my eyes. I immediately took that chance and ran and told my parents. They obviously didn't believe me and probably still don't to this day. My mum shrugged it off and my dad just laughed at me, which didn't surprise me. He'd be the dad in the horror movie going, nothing is wrong with this house, as pots and pans float midair around him in the kitchen and all crazy stuff happens. But after this, as long as I've lived in that house, I've always closed the door every time that I've entered that bathroom from then on, and I always slept with the light on for years too. Anyway, I heard a, another story about a shadow person here some other time, and it, it inspired me to tell my own. To this day, I still wonder what the heck happened and what it wanted, but I guess that I'll probably never know. Years ago, when I was 11, I was staying home alone with only my little brother who was 7. At that time, it was about 9pm, dark and pouring rain, and we were reading in our room right next to the front door with a big window and open blinds. That's when I hear the front doorbell ring followed by knocking. I thought my parents had arrived. Strange though that they didn't use the garage or the keys like they always do. I looked outside to see their car but nothing but rain. As I approach the door I hear a man's voice that was definitely not my father's yell through the torrent. Hey would you guys like some cookies? We're selling Girl Scout cookies. I'm shocked at this considering the weather and the time of day. Saying nothing, I check the peephole and peer through the side window, only to see that it was definitely not my father with his girl as I expected. My heart dropped because standing there was just a, a fully grown man, maybe in his late fifties, a no box of cookies in sight, soaking on my doorstep. I can remember the gut-wrenching feeling of having to check the locks while he was right on the other side. 
for sure he heard this too. The two locks were the only thing separating myself and brother from a potential monster. But he continued to knock and mention his cookies as I considered whether or not I should call the cops. That's when I remember too that the blinds, they were open in my room where my brother was with the light on. As I turn the corner into the doorway, I see the man carefully peering into our window, possibly eyeing my brother, distracted in his book. But my heart was pounding now as I began to panic, and in a move that took all of my willpower, I quickly turned off the lights and ran over to the window to close the blinds in full view of the man. As fast as I could, I double-checked all the locks in the house, closed all the blinds, and told my brother to go and hang out in one of the big closets in the interior of the house. No windows. I didn't tell him what was going on so he wouldn't be frightened, and for some reason I never did call the cops or my parents. I just waited in the hallway until finally he must have left. Still thinking about it gives me the shivers that so many things could have gone wrong that night. My worst fear since then is a stranger getting to the unlocked door before I do. This happened in Grindstone, Pennsylvania back in the 90s. I was probably about 8 years old and my brother was about 5-ish. We lived on a couple of acres in the country with a farm on one side and your basic farm fencing with a thick forest on the other side. And with growing up in the sticks and dad being an avid hunter, us kids were taught to be aware of our surroundings and wild animals and things like that. Also, we were always taught not to just wander off without telling an adult, not to trust strangers as well, and the normal safety stuff that kids are taught. Anyways, as a kid, I always thought the woods were creepy or kind of scary. There was no way in heck as well that I was about to go off into them by myself. Way too many scary movies at this point. So, I was playing outside with my little brother one day and he went into the house. There I was by myself and I heard my mum calling for me. Kimberly, come here. Over here. Come on, Kimmy. This was a little weird to me because why would my mum be in the woods right now? I climbed over the fence anyways and started walking towards my mum's voice. Then, out of the blue, I felt like I was being watched and got a really bad feeling. I started to wonder how mum got into the woods without going past me. You know, thoughts like that. So I turned and quickly ran back to the house where I found mum at the kitchen table and my brother playing video games in the living room. I then asked her if she called for me and she said no. She asked me why, so I told her what happened. This led to us kids being told to stay inside and play for the rest of the day. I'm now in my early 30s and I've asked my mum many times about this incident. She always swears that she never did call for me that day. There's something about this situation though that really just bothers me. I don't know what it is but for some reason my skin always crawls when I think about it. So I was driving home late one night. There were virtually no cars on the road. Eventually though, I noticed a cop car had zoomed up close behind me as if to pull me over. Only, something was off. I couldn't tell how long it had actually been behind me because there was no siren and none of the lights were on. And not the little police laptop, not even the headlights even. In any event, realizing a cop was riding my tail, I pulled over. I was an 18 or 19 year old black kid who had just moved from the inner city so my instinct was to comply but looking back I, I just definitely should have kept driving. Anyway, sure enough the patrol car pulled over behind me but whoever was in the patrol car didn't get out, didn't turn on the lights or the siren either. The only illumination was a few of those sickly yellow halogen street lamps a block or so away and with no passing cars I couldn't actually see into the patrol car so all I could see was a hardly discernible silhouette in the driver's seat. I sat there for a while. I don't really remember how long but it had to have been around five minutes. Near total silence. I remember just being puzzled at first too. I think I even said what the heck under my breath a few times but 
I just sat there, staring into the dark patrol car through my rear view. And then my brain began to turn over. There was just a, a creepy feeling that I was in danger all of a sudden. And it clicked that I was either being pranked or I was about to be subject to something much worse. Finally, I calmly started my engine and pulled away. And the patrol car, it didn't follow. A year ago, I experienced something that still frightens me. But let me start at the beginning from a few years ago. At this time, I was a normal 15-year-old girl that lived with my family in a big old house in Switzerland. At this time, I started dating a girl there that lives in the same street like me, and soon we started to spend more and more time in my house together, until she moved finally about a year later. So my parents lived in the ground floor, me and my girlfriend and my sister lived in the middle floor and the upper floor was empty. I never really felt uncomfortable in my house or anything, but after she moved in, that's when things started to change slowly. My girlfriend was a little bit paranoid, but I could understand that. Even after our house was renovated, it was still an old house made of wood and old houses make some weird noises, right? You hear the wind howling through the attic, you hear the rain draining through the gutter, or you hear some crackling noises from the wooden beam starting to stretch when it gets warm, and she just didn't know noises like that because she lived in a very modern and quiet apartment. But sometimes she would shake me awake in the night because she heard footsteps or other noises, most times from the floor above us with the empty guest rooms. I would always calm her down with, uh, that's just the house, or the wooden beams crackling, or our cats walking around or playing with each other. But that wasn't the only thing. You see, even after years, she was just always scared of being alone at home like a, a little kid. I guess I could sort of understand that too. It's scary being alone in a big old house when you lived in a modern apartment. But years went by, and... I must admit that I started to get a little bit paranoid too. I mean, it's really weird to be home alone or to go to the upper floor alone when somebody says that the whole time there's somebody or something up there and I also started to hear sounds too. Not in the same direct way, but I think I got paranoid like, was that really a cat or just the wind in the attic? So I started to get slowly uncomfortable in my own house. To be fair though, I didn't think too much about it until one evening that honestly changed everything. So it was a really nice summer evening last year. My older brother and his wife organized a barbecue for the family on this evening. My parents decided to spend the night there with my brother, but we wanted to go back to our house, so we did. I drive home with my girlfriend, my sister and her boyfriend... It was really late, like 3am or something when we arrived. I drive in the forecourt of our house and my sister says something like, there's a light on in the upper floor. I say, maybe we forgot to turn the light off on our floor or something, but my girlfriend says that no, it's definitely the upper floor. We get out of the car and we look at our house and indeed, we see the light on in the upper floor. The problem is that the light switch for the upper floor is in the upper floor, so none of us were up there and we can't turn on the light by accident or anything. I want to go in and I want to walk to the door, but my girlfriend quickly takes my hand and pulls me back really roughly. She lifted her other arm up and points to the big window in the upper floor. And we were so scared that we couldn't move when we saw somebody standing in the window he or she or or whatever it was slowly walks to the window and looks directly to us after a few seconds of just looking at this person with absolute fear all throughout my body the light just goes out well we jumped into the car in panic and drove away as fast as we could all of us saw the exact same thing Somebody or something was definitely standing in the upper floor and looking directly at us. And the only time that we went back to that house after this was to get our stuff out of there to go and visit my parents. We never did go up to that floor again or spend the night there again after that. And for that, I am very grateful. A 
So I'm 18, female, and I'm from the UK. This happened in February of 2019. I was 17 at the time. I got set up on a semi-blind date. We had seen some photos of each other by a mutual friend, and his name was Cameron, and he was also 19. Cameron seemed like your typical average guy, maybe a little into video games and anime and stuff, but overall nothing my friend told me about him seemed often anyway. My mutual friend gave us each other's numbers, and we texted for a night and decided to meet in a Starbucks the next day since we were both free. I never liked to meet new people this soon, but I figured since Cameron knew my friend, it couldn't possibly go wrong. But boy, how mistaken I was. So I arrived slightly early, ordered my coffee since I never really like guys to feel that they have to buy for me, and parked up on a seat facing away from the door and pulled out my book. I may be there for uh, 15 minutes just sort of chilling out and I get a text saying that he's here. So I'm like, great, I'm at X table. I feel a presence over my shoulder and I turn my head slightly in acknowledgement. He must be here, I thought. But before I even get the chance to squeak out a hello, his lips latch onto my neck and he starts sucking on my neck. Now, I don't like people touching my neck at the best of times. I'm actually very ticklish there and I get super uncomfortable by people even touching my neck. The few times that I've had massages or hair treatments or whatnot, I've been holding in my discomfort. And he's now latched onto my neck like some sort of a leech. And this man smells just horrendous. Kind of like a dust personified or something. I freak out and elbow his chest to get him the heck off of me. He lets go and looks at me with this weird expression on his face and laughs in sort of deadpan. It's really, really creepy too, and I start to become alarmed. I ask him what the heck that was, and he just says, I thought it was cute. Cute in what world though, right? I uh, try to have some sort of a conversation with him. I'm like, okay, first impressions don't mean anything. Uh, let's try and give him a, a chance, I guess but he's just creepily staring at my chest and he says, wow, I didn't know Asians could have boobs like those. I better not let you go. That was a direct quote too. You can't make this stuff up. I'm distinctly uncomfortable, but I don't want to just run away. He's giving me really weird vibes, so I just go into the ladies' bathroom and wait for somebody else to come in. I ask her to help me get out undetected. I don't want this man following me home or something. She of course agrees and she lends me her hat and scarf. It's February in the UK after all. And we come out of the bathroom together and she manages to help sneak out of the back door of the Starbucks without him noticing me. He asked my friend where I went but I told my friend to never mention me again. I was too terrified. I know that I probably didn't behave well. I should have just told him that I was leaving, that I'd had enough and I wasn't interested in him but... I was honestly just sort of scared. But a few people are asking about this friend and the friend told me off for leaving without telling Cameron saying that I was horrible and should have given him a chance. So I just ended up unfriending him too. Can't be having people like that in your life, right? And I also just want to let everyone know that yes, I'm actually okay. It's been over a year since I've even had a glimpse of Cameron. So thanks for anyone who may be concerned, but I'm doing okay. We all need a good Samaritan from here and there sometimes, so if you do see somebody in need, like I was that day, then please make sure to act like that lady and help a girl or even a guy perhaps out. It was around 6pm on a main road. It was winter time, so it was already dark out. I was just walking my dog and was listening to music. I'm a 22-year-old female with a tiny 20-pound dog. As I was walking, though, I saw a car park down a small side road, out of the light cast by the street lamps. It was a silver minivan. All I could see was a shadow in the driver's seat. I kept walking, but I had my eye on this minivan because it was sort of in a weird spot. But the minivan eventually started to creep up on me, though, so I picked up my pace. The minivan eventually pulled over next to me and there was a man in the driver's seat. He asked me, Hey, excuse me, 
could you please help me with something? And at this, I just started to run away. I turned back and I saw that he had actually thrown his door open and started to run after me. When he got to the other side of the van, I could see that his pants were around his ankles and he was trying to run after me with his pants sort of down. He screams to me that he was going to kill me. I ran up to the nearest house and he pulled off. I left my dog at the door at the person's house and sprinted after this van. I wrote down the make, the model and the license plate on my phone and I immediately called the police. He actually ended up being caught and arrested 30 minutes later in a parking lot with his pants still down. And perhaps the creepiest part is that he found several weapons and other tools in his car, like duct tape, zip ties, hammers, saws, you name it. It was in there. Last night it was around 11.30pm and everyone in my house had gone to sleep already. Right now, it's just me, my mom, and my brother living in our house because my dad still has to go to work and he doesn't really want to risk exposing us to COVID-19. So he sleeps in our second home, which is a few minutes away. I'm a 21-year-old girl and I'm home from college, so I'm staying in my childhood bedroom on the second floor. My window is directly above the part of my backyard where my dad keeps trash cans to collect rainwater. It hasn't rained in the last couple of days, so the trash cans are empty. There are three trash cans directly under my window, though. All the lights in my house were off except my bedside lamp. I was in my bed just texting some friends when I heard a faint screech directly outside of my window. I stopped what I was doing and immediately turned off my lamp. Then I listened again, trying to figure out if it was a cat or a child that I'd just heard. I didn't hear anything, so I just chalked it up to my imagination. But I was on edge as I'd never really heard a sound like that before. I kept my lamp off though as I don't have any curtains. I only have vertical shutters and light definitely bleeds through. A few more minutes pass. Then I hear another noise but this time it sounds like a child's laughter. I froze because I've read stories about how people will try to lure unsuspecting victims by playing tapes of babies crying. But I never thought that it could happen to me and I know that my immediate neighbours on both sides both have young children and I wondered if one of them somehow got out of their house or something. My window faces the neighbour to the right of my house and our houses are relatively close together after all. I know that they have a toddler as well. They also have a giant pit bull who spends some nights outside in their backyard. There's maybe a 10 feet space between our houses and we share a fence as well. So I get out of bed and cautiously walk over to my window. First, I only open my shutter a sliver as I don't want to be seen if there's somebody outside. I can't see anything, but I heard the noise more clearly now. And it's definitely a child's laughter. It sounds close. So I open my shutter completely, trying to see who's making the noise. By this time, it's almost midnight, mind you, but I don't see anyone but I keep hearing the laughter. I try to look into my neighbor's yard, but I, I don't see anything, and I don't think their dog is out. I'm pretty creeped out now, so I go back to my bed, and I just try to go to sleep. I must have laid on my bed for about five minutes when I hear a noise outside my window again, and I don't really know how to describe it, but the hairs on my arm and neck are standing up as I'm typing this. At first, I heard sort of a thud and then it sounded like someone was directly below my window moving the trash cans. I told myself that it was probably the neighbor's dog moving around, but I knew that it couldn't have been because whenever he's outside, he barks and plus I didn't see him when I looked out my window. A few moments pass and I breathe a sigh of relief and relax a bit. Then I heard a clunk or a knock on my window and I got up again. I was so scared though that I couldn't move and I prayed that I just imagined those noises. But then I heard a louder clunk and I ran out of my room to my mum and told her what had happened. My mum turned on all the lights and came to my room and looked out my window but we didn't see anyone. Then she double checked all the doors were locked and she told me to sleep with her that night. So I moved all of my blankets and pillows to my mum's room and I ended up sleeping there. 
And today, when I woke up, I had already forgotten about the events of last night. I was in my room getting dressed, I was standing in front of my mirror, and I saw something was being reflected on my carpet under my windowsill. I went down to investigate, and I realized pretty quickly that it was glass. Admittedly, I had a few picture frames by my window, and I thought one of them must have been knocked down when my mum and I looked out the window last night. So I look at each picture frame, trying to see which one broke. I scan through the frames once, and then I feel my heart drop. I scan through them again to make sure that I didn't miss any the first time. But all of my frames are intact and accounted for. So I slowly reach for my shutters and pull them open. More pieces of glass fall at my feet. And immediately... I feel sick because my window, it's partially broken. I scream and my mum comes and I show her my window. My mum asks me how this could have happened as my window wasn't broken when we looked out at last night. And there's nothing in my backyard that could have caused that. My room is on the side of my house and on the second floor and there are no trees on that side of my house at all. No trees in my neighbor's side yard either. There were also no dead animals or blood, which would have signaled an animal crashing into my window or something. We don't have a security system or any security cameras. Plus, my dad can't even stay the night with us at the moment. I uh, don't want to be afraid to sleep in my own room, but at this stage, I just don't want to be in there. So, I don't really want to give too much away about myself, but back in 06, let's just say that I was training with a special ops unit. At this time, I was completely mentally sound, extremely physically fit, and probably more adept in the wilderness than most of the experienced hikers detailed in these cases, not to mention armed to the teeth. Just a week before my final exam, we were running a drill of which I cannot tell you the specifics, but my duty was to stand at the perimeter on the backside of the assault in case the opposition tried to circle behind us. It was like the third time that we'd run this drill and I knew that I was in hurry up and wait mode today. Bored out of my mind, I started scanning the tree lines. I noticed what I can only call a path as well. It wasn't a path in the traditional sense, but the trees on either side of it formed a straight line. And one of the things they taught us when learning to survive from an elevated vantage point was nature doesn't build in straight lines. To this day, I just cannot explain what came over me, but I laid my gun down and I just started walking. Walking turned to a jog, jog turned to a sprint... I can remember thinking that I really wanted to know where this thing led and how many people before me had run down a straight path like this in nature. During PT, I survived long distance runs on tracks by looking down at my feet, so out of habit I think, I looked down at my feet and I just sort of snapped out of it. I immediately thought, you know, what the heck am I doing? And I turned around and hightailed it back to my post. The path was less straight than I remembered and much further back to my post. I had no loss of time. I saw no scary woman beckoning me into the woods or anything and I felt no sense of great dread or something like that that I've heard before. But I returned to my post and the drill concluded. All of the drills were monitored with cameras at each of our positions so I actually had to answer for my actions. Honestly too, I, I thought that I was done for. They questioned me and I told them straight up that I just didn't know what came over me. Just a, a massive urge to follow that path and keep going. My superior simply told me to resist that urge should I ever feel it again and that sent me on my way. I graduated a week later and I never really thought anything of it. Now, here's the real kicker though. There was a troubled teen school nearby... We used to run into them all the time and they'd come out and watch our final physical test. I'd heard rumours from people though that it shut down in 2010 because a kid apparently went missing. They covered it up and filed bankruptcy after telling the kid's family that he committed suicide but they couldn't produce a body. And his last known location was my exact post during that day that I temporarily lost my senses.
This happened about a year ago and there were just so many terrible factors working against me that night that I'm honestly astounded that I got away unscathed. At least physically that is. This all begins when I'm at my friend's apartment who lives in a really rough part of town. In a series of poor decisions, that night I decided to get belligerently drunk and take a few pills of who knows what. And yes, I, I know, I know. Safe to say though that after a solid night of partying, around 4am I was definitely not in the right state of mind. My drug addled brain decides that instead of staying that night at my friend's apartment like I normally would, I wanted to Uber back to my own apartment instead. My friend's apartment had two separate entrances or exits to the building, one in the back unlit parking lot of the building and one facing the street. They had two sets of keys for each door and I only had keys to one in the back of the apartment. But since my Uber would obviously arrive at the street and the door in the front of the building locks itself behind you, I exited this way when the driver was soon to arrive. Looking back, standing outside that apartment... I realize that I must have looked like the easiest target on the planet. I'm a small petite female in my early 20s and I can hardly stay upright. I'm using a street lamp to prop myself up and not doing a good job at that either. The light was basically a beacon for many nearby predators saying come and get me. I'm not paying attention to any of my surroundings at all in this state. Despite the fact that there was literally a bullet hole in the front door that I came out of which is not good. I do remember checking to see what car I was getting picked up in and was only able to pick out the fact that it was a black sedan. Soon after stepping outside, a black sedan pulls up to the curb and starts rolling down the window, so I step forward. Now, before this man even spoke, I could feel that something was just wrong. He had an expression like he was tearing me apart with just his eyes, and after seeing that look, it gave me a new meaning to the word predator to describe a criminal because I then knew what it felt like to be prey. He basically barks at me, I'm your Uber driver. This was the second red flag that somehow made its way through my brain. Normally Uber drivers just roll down their window and they say your name, but I think I just stared at him for a second, my brain slowly piecing together the situation that I was potentially in, and I ask him, What's my name? He immediately is enraged and starts screaming about how he doesn't have time for this and just get in the car, etc, etc. Quite honestly, I don't think that I've ever sobered up so fast in my life before. I'm completely panicking. Obviously, this wasn't my Uber. I'm quickly checking the license plate, I immediately see that it's not a match. Meanwhile, this guy is still screaming at me and I have absolutely no idea what to do. If I bolt in either direction, this guy could easily outrun me or have a weapon or something. I'm also pretty sure at this point that if he's trying to nab a random girl off the street, he must have a weapon of some sort. I can't run back into the apartment door right behind me since it locks right behind you and I don't have the keys nor time to unlock it. Running towards the back door would do nothing as well as he's idling right by the mouth of the driveway towards the back parking lot and again I would have to take the time to find the right keys and get in. If I screamed I'm not exactly in the right type of neighborhood where someone would try to be a vigilante and I can still hear the music radiating from my friend's third floor apartment and I just knew that they weren't about to hear me. Also it's four in the morning and absolutely nobody is around. People talk a lot about these sorts of situations where they either sprint into action or they freeze, but I felt incapable of doing either one of those things. It was the absolute worst feeling that I've ever felt in my life though. Everything in me wanted to run, but I felt that if I did that it was going to be the end of me. But if I kept standing there staring in shock at this screaming man, the result would be the same. From when he started screaming at me up until this point, I'm guessing it was only about 20 seconds that had passed. And just as he's looking like he's getting ready to get out of the car, another black sedan pulls up right behind him. Checking the license plate as quickly as I can, I realize that it's my actual Uber and I make a full sprint to the car, at really only like six steps, and throw myself in screaming at my real Uber driver, what's my name? The poor dude looks terrified but responds with my name quickly to which I reply, get me out of here, this man is trying to kidnap me. If I was in this Uber driver's position, 
I think I would have been too shocked to react as quickly as he did, but my dude, he flew out of there, offered to call the cops for me, which I declined, and now regret too, and then walked me to the front door of my apartment, ensuring that I got inside safely. But truly, an incredible human being. You can rest easy too knowing that he got the fattest tip my college student bank account would allow for, although he deserved much, much more than that. I'm very confident in saying that I think that man, he may have just saved my life that night. So this happened back in September of 2019 when I was 15. Just to set the scene as well, my kitchen and dining room, they're connected with the kitchen window facing out to the front garden with no trees or plants in them. This will be important later. So a couple of weeks prior to the main event, I came downstairs to get some cereal at around 10pm. I was pouring the cereal when I heard one faint light tap against the window. I stopped and took a minute to think about what I just heard and whether it was in my head or if someone had actually just tapped on the window. However, I wasn't going to open the blinds to find out because, well, I believe in ghosts and I'm scared of dark places, plus there could have been somebody out there, so I was pretty much just out of there. I did forget about what happened until a few weeks later, early September, when I was coincidentally going down late at night, maybe 1am I think, to get some cereal again, but as I was getting everything out, I heard one solid tap on the window then another and another one but weirdly in a sort of regular pattern and the tap sounded like somebody's finger was tapping on the glass which made it even creepier obviously. The part that sent chills down my spine this time was the fact that the blinds were open so I didn't want to look outside. I quickly just sped walked up the stairs like there was no tomorrow and I knocked on my mum's door to tell her what had happened Obviously, she was asleep, but I was crapping bricks, so it was always comforting to speak about things with her. But as I walked into her room, the light from the hallway faintly filled the room, where I saw this huge shadow hovering above my mum's bed. This all happened within about two seconds, but it appeared to flutter some wings or something, and then it just dove straight towards me. I closed my eyes out of fear of what I just saw, and... I don't really remember much for the next two minute period, so this is all according to my mum, but apparently I just stood there hyperventilating with my eyes sealed shut. It took me a solid minute to calm my breathing down to a normal pace where I then finally came to and just decided to call it a night. Safe to say that I laid in my bed that night with the lights on and it was a, a very sleepless night. This happened a week ago and my blood still runs cold when I think about it. So my brother wanted to get a drink from a place that we both love to go to. It was going to close soon and he had work to do so I went by myself. It wasn't very late but it was already dark and my parents had drummed into me since birth about the dangers of walking alone at night. I was kind of nervous that day I'll admit even though I've done it many times before. But I went and got both drinks and... For some reason, I forgot to bring her back. I was walking along with both hands full. Bad idea, mind you. As I was walking towards the street where my house was, I suddenly became aware of two men very near me. One was in front of me wearing a maroon pullover, and the other was behind me wearing a grey zipped up hoodie with the hood pulled up. I only really turned around for a flash of a second, so I couldn't describe his face to you. I was weirded out though because I was walking between them and I was beginning to feel uncomfortable like they were trying to hurt me or something. And just as I was telling myself that I was clearly overreacting, I came across a garage that was down an alleyway and a black Subaru was coming out of it. I had time so I crossed before they reached me. The person inside clearly wasn't counting on me doing that so they sort of swung around and parallel parked next to me at most only two feet away. So now I was between three men and a wall. And when I saw that door open, that was it for me. I just bolted and I didn't stop running until I reached my house.
This happened about uh, maybe 11 months ago when me and my wife got married in June. And I will never be so grateful that I have a habit of locking doors. So our wedding day was coming to an end. Family and friends were slowly starting to depart as me and my wife Diana took pictures and chatted with some of the guests who stayed a little longer and were just having a good time. It was a great day too and a lot of fond memories were made but what was least expected is what happened that night as we were on our way to our honeymoon. As me and Diana said goodbye to the last of the guests, 9pm, we got in the car and we headed home. We had our bags packed prior to the wedding day for Cancun and we were ready to go. I live in WA and we were in a bit of a hurry because instead of flying out from the Seattle airport in SeaTac, like normal people do, it was a lot cheaper for us to drive up north to Canada and fly out from the Canadian airport. Also, me and my wife thought that it'd be fun to have a sort of little road trip to Canada and then fly out from Canada to Cancun. Plus, it was only a three and a half hour drive for us and cheaper too, so we headed out, 12 a.m. We had a great time too, just driving and blasting music, talking about Cancun and just being excited about the new next chapter in our lives. Diana slowly started to fall asleep, being exhausted from the wedding and whatnot. But we were halfway to Canada. At this point too, we were no longer in the city area, but more a, a wooded area with fewer cars and fewer people the more that we drove, practically seeing no one on the road. By that time, it was around 3 a.m., we had some extra time on our hands and I was starting to fall asleep too, so I just sort of pulled over to a gas station to get some Red Bull to keep me awake and whatnot. I pulled into the gas station that was completely empty and parked the car to see Diana asleep. I told her that I'm taking the keys and that I would lock her inside and that I would be right back. I'm not sure if she could hear me, but she kind of motioned her hand around like people normally do when they're just too tired to care. I came back around six minutes later to find wife shaking and crying. I was confused and freaking out a bit because I wasn't sure why she was crying. She couldn't even get words out at first. But later, once she calmed down, she told me this. So apparently, she did hear me when I told her that I'd take the keys and be right back. And as she was sleeping, she was woken by a tapping on the driver's side window. Being too tired to get up though, or even open her eyes, she lazily went for the unlock button on the passenger side of the door, assuming that it was me. As she was going for it though, she just sort of froze and a thought passed her mind. Then she remembered, didn't he say that he had his keys? Why would he need me to unlock the door for him? That's when she heard a woman's voice mumbling from the driver's side. She turned herself around to look at the window and she saw a woman long black hair with wide eyes and a sort of crooked smile on her face. She couldn't really hear what she was saying at first, but then as she listened closely, she could hear it. She kept repeating in a sort of mumbled tone, are you tired, just over and over. She really freaked out and told the woman to just leave her alone. The woman allegedly laughed and told my wife that she was tired too. The woman never took her eyes off of her and tried the door handle at one point. At this point too, my wife was close to tears and attempted to call me, but as she did, she heard what sounded like a phone buzz and realized that I had left my phone in the car. Out of options now, my wife started to honk the horn trying to scare off the woman while also maybe getting my attention. The woman still had her gaze on her and started mumbling more while laughing and trying the door handle again. Then, she mentioned something about someone named Sarah and asked my wife if she knew her. After a few more minutes of this mumbling, she eventually left and to my wife's word, the minute that she left, I came out of the gas station. So, my wife broke down. I still don't know how I didn't hear the honking of the car and I still feel bad for leaving my phone in the car like that. My wife has also added that one of the creepier things about that woman is that she didn't look homeless or dirty or anything. In fact, she looked completely normal and well kept. My wife said that she'll never forget the woman's white eyes and the gaze that she had on her with that smile. It also chills me to think what would have happened if my wife never realized that I had the keys or if she never had heard me about locking her inside. 
and open the door while face the other way or something. I don't know what those women's intentions were, but if I couldn't hear the honk of the horn, then I'm definitely sure that there's no way that I would have heard screams. So basically, I've lived in this house for most of my life now. It's small and in a quiet neighborhood. Nothing out of the ordinary ever really happens here. But lately, over the past year, I've just had some weird experiences. I'll share three main ones that really shake me whenever I think about them. So, the first one happened about six months ago. I usually get home from school around 4.30ish because I have swim practice when school ends. My mum usually gets home at around 6, and almost every day, I follow the same routine. Get home, eat a snack, watch a bit of TV, do some homework on the couch, and that's about it. Today was pretty much no different, and as soon as I got my snack, I sat down on the couch and began to watch some TV. After about an hour of watching TV, I started to feel super groggy out of nowhere and could barely keep my eyes open. I woke up about 30 minutes later to my mum shaking me, telling me to open all of the windows. Apparently, when she got home, the carbon monoxide alarm was going off, so she checked the heater in the kitchen. When she walked into the kitchen, all of the stove burners were turned on to where there was no fire, but gas was just leaking out everywhere. She blamed it on me, but I specifically remember not using the stove, and if I did... Why would I turn on all of the burners anyway? That was the first encounter too that made me feel like something was off in this house. The second encounter happened a few months after the first. My mum and I were building a dresser from Ikea and well, we needed a screwdriver. We always keep a bag of house tools in the hall closet and more outside of the garage. She sent me to go and get some tools from the tool bag in the hall closet. But when I got there, there was no screwdrivers in there. Like, none. No flathead or star ones. No small or large or any. All of the rest of the tools were there though, so I told her and she said that that was weird, but to go and check in the garage. I went into the garage and once again there were absolutely no screwdrivers. And I was like, what the heck is going on? Anyways... I went back inside and I told my mum and of course she was like, oh, I guess I'll have to go and get them myself. So we both checked the hall closet, none were there. The garage, again, none were there. Coming back into the house, we stopped in the kitchen and talked about how weird that was because we hardly ever used the tools so where could they have gone? We walked down the hall into the living room and both of us immediately gasped. Because, on the middle of the carpet, is a pile of 10 to 15 screwdrivers, just sitting there. We both looked at each other out of confusion, and I also think a, a little bit of fear. This third one happened about a week ago, and is honestly the scariest one. It gives me goosebumps just talking about it, in fact. One night, I was sitting at my computer watching YouTube. It was a little bit late, around 2 or 3 in the morning, I think. I always leave the hall light on with my door shut because I'm afraid of the dark and it gives me just a little bit of light. So I'm watching YouTube and I kept hearing my mum walking from her room to the living room which is weird because I remember her going to bed a couple of hours ago and she's a really heavy sleeper who doesn't wake up for pretty much anything so I called out to her but nobody answered. So I was like well that's weird. And then I heard the footsteps again, so I looked under the door and I could have sworn that I saw like a, a shadow of feet standing there and I thought it was my mum, so I was like, why doesn't she open the door? So I got up and opened the door, but when I did, there was nobody there. I went into my mum's room and she was dead asleep, like snoring and everything, and I was immediately creeped out, so I woke her up and was like, why do you keep walking down the hall? And she was like, what? I've been asleep since like 11. 
In the end, I just sort of brushed it off as just my imagination, so I went back into my room and sat down at my computer and watched my show for like another 20 more minutes. But then, I hear a click of the light switch out in the hall. I looked under the door and it was pitch black and I was like, what? So I opened my door and the light was off. And I know that I left it on because, well, I always do. So I woke my mum up again and was like, did you turn the light off? And she was like, no. And so I was even more creeped out and I ended up sleeping with my room lights on after that. Anyways, there's a lot of other small things that have happened in my house too. Like sometimes doors will open on their own or I can hear something walking around and stuff moving at night. I always feel like I'm being watched as well or that there's something here with me. And the whole vibe of our house just feels off and really scary. I don't know what changed or how this happened, but if anyone has any ideas, then please comment or give me some advice or something. I've tried using sage, by the way, to clean the house of negative energy because I heard that that can work, but that just hasn't seemed to do anything. I just really don't know anything about any of this stuff and I feel like I'm just way out of my depth. About a year ago, I was living with my mate. I stayed in a ground floor flat that kind of sits in a cul-de-sac and is a bit of a pain to walk to, I'll admit. A kind of detached from the community. The only times I ever felt completely secure are during sunlight, depending on the time of year. The block of flats is kind of an L-shape. Our entrance sits kind of inside that 90 degree angle. Inside the main building, there's a flat either side and stairs in front. The immediate entrance hall is very dark, I feel like the lights choose when and when not to work as well. The flats are basic. A hallway, two double door bedrooms, a bathroom, decent living room and small kitchen. The hallway is quite long and the living room is at the end of it. Both bedrooms face each other so we can talk from our doorways, if that makes sense. I'm telling you this too because it'll help you picture the incident. So it was about 11, 11.30 at night and my flatmate was in her room presumably sleeping. She had a habit of leaving things unlocked and I have to make sure everything is locked up before I head off to sleep. But she'd gotten better and normally at least had the chain on the door, if it wasn't locked that is. She always goes to bed early though so it wasn't weird or anything. I was in the living room and decided to grab a pint of water before heading to bed myself. I went into the kitchen which is attached to the living room switching on the kitchen light and filling up a glass. The car park in front of the flat was really dark. I remember feeling kind of eerie that night too and I just wasn't sure why but I just felt like something was off. If I had to describe it, it was that kind of feeling that you get when you switch the light off and you run up the stairs. Anyway, I had a couple of sips and filled the glass a little more and headed out to the kitchen when the front doorbell went. I sort of froze. I didn't even know that we had a doorbell to be honest. About 10 seconds passed before the letterbox was hit twice and my stomach sank. I sort of felt trapped in the kitchen. Important to know two things here as well. One, if you step out of the kitchen it puts you in perfect line with the hallway if the living room door is open which it was at that time. And two, our front door has a bloody window so you can see the silhouettes of anyone outside or in. Us being girls, we had a sort of cute grey curtain across it but it was pretty much see-through. So I grabbed my phone and I called my mate who was in a room right next to the front door. We both whispered, did you hear that? Both thinking that we may have misheard it. We had to whisper too because the walls were like paper thin in that flat. You could always hear people coming and going in the clothes. She came to her bedroom doorway but couldn't go forward because then she'd be in direct sight of the window. I edged my way out of the kitchen keeping flat against the wall, eventually sinking to the floor, texting her now because we were both closer to the door and whoever was out there would probably hear us. Another thing that you should probably know is that this person must have buzzed other flats to get into the building but didn't buzz ours. So I reckon that they must have seen me from the kitchen window. I'm a fairly ordinary looking 120 pound girl. But 
lying in kind of an army crawl, I saw the silhouette of a tall, broad, bald man. It could have only been a man as well because he was so tall and broad. He tapped the letterbox again but just sort of stood there. Terrified now, I mouthed to my mate, did you lock the door? And she looked at me with a horrified expression on her face and mouthed, no. The chain wasn't on the door either. Now or never, I supposed. I crawled as low as I could into my bedroom, crawled up to my desk, grabbed my keys, crawled to the door. It's only about a meter and frantically shoved the keys in the lock and twisted, at the same time putting the chain on. This is a noisy affair too, and he obviously noticed that I was there, hitting the letterbox again and trying the handle as I desperately tried to twist the crap old school key in the lock, and eventually I got it. Terrified to stand, my mate put her head out her room to see if we were cool, and he wasn't there anymore. In a kind of half-stoned, half-asleep stupor, she reckoned to just go back to bed, but something was just nagging at me though, really badly. Remember how I said that we could hear people coming and going really easily? It was just eerily quiet, and not once did either of us hear the building's main door open or close, which meant that this was probably somebody in this building. We had one person across from us, two people above us, and two above them. Two of those flats are students. A neighbor across was a 98-year-old woman. There was a couple and a sort of short, long-haired, chill guy. Nobody we knew matched the frame of the man in our flat window, but I stayed up until I couldn't anymore, texting mates, just sort of jamming in my room, door shut, keeping my hockey stick next to my bed. But I realized about a month after this that the service button to the front of the main building was actually broken and anyone could have come in if they pressed it and could be unheard coming in if they were very quiet and knew that they had to be very careful with the door as it was old and heavy. I still think though that they must have seen me in the kitchen in the light and thought that they would try their luck. And this could have easily been a very different story if I hadn't have locked the door when I did. Always lock your doors people. Double check them too because... No matter how safe you reckon your area is, it just may not be. We have literally no idea to this day who that was or why they knocked like that. But we never heard anyone again use that doorbell. I'll start by saying that I'm 19 years old and these hauntings occurred from 7 to 8 years old. I'm not a religious person at all. In fact, I'm one of those people that has to see something to believe it. When people tell me stories of how this or that happened to them, I always try to come up with a logical explanation for what they experienced. Now, that being said, this shook me to my core and I avoid sharing what happened to me with other people simply because I cannot even think about this time in my life without swelling up in tears. So... As a child, I didn't like scary movies, ghost stories, none of that stuff really. I was scared of the dark and bedtime, and for me it was a struggle because my mother would have to sit beside my bed until I went to sleep before she was able to leave the room. After I would fall asleep, I would always wake up at around 2am and be scared that I was alone and walk to my mother's room down the hall to get into bed with her and go back to sleep. The only people in the house during this time were my older sister, mum and me. Now, the first incident I had occurred when I woke up in the middle of the night again and I got up to go to my mother's room. When I got to her room and opened the door, that was when I saw it. An extremely pale, short, bald man was sitting in the middle of her bed. I was paralyzed in fear and just stared at this guy for a few seconds, trying to understand what I was looking at. The man's head rose and he looked at me as I stood in the doorway. His face was completely smooth, no eyes, mouth or anything, just a, a powdered white face. The moment that I saw him look up at me too, I immediately collapsed into the floor and started screaming and crying and calling for my mother to wake up. My mum jumped up out of bed and ran over to me and tried to calm me down. I was trying to tell her that there was a man in her room, but she kept telling me that it was just a bad dream, that I needed to go back to bed. 
quickly looked around the room, intending to show her, but I didn't see the man anywhere. When I calmed down a bit, I asked if me and her could both stay in my room for the night because I was too frightened to sleep alone, but I definitely didn't want to go back into her room after that. The morning after, I tried to explain to my mum what I had seen the night before, but she just didn't want to hear it. She shrugged it off and told me that it was just a bad dream again. I was so sure what I had seen though and I tried to tell my sister but she just dismissed me as well. After this experience, I was terrified that it would happen again though. The following nights were horrible too. My mother would tuck me into bed like usual and wait until I fell asleep to leave. Except now, I was freaking out that I was asleep so she would go into her room. When she left, I would get up and turn on all the lights in my room and I would just play around with my action figures or play on my PlayStation. I would do this until the next morning, in fact. It was during the day that I would take naps on the couch, but my mother didn't like that. She wanted to get out and play during the day so that I was able to sleep well at night. And obviously, this led to me losing an insane amount of sleep because I was too scared to sleep at night, but my mum wasn't going to let me sleep at all throughout the day. It had been around two or three weeks, I would say, since the first incident happened, and I was starting to think that maybe mum was right and that it had all been a dream. One day, I was particularly exhausted and fell asleep on the couch in the living room and slept until the middle of the night. I woke up to a pitch black room and immediately began to have a panic attack. Even when I woke up in my own room, I always had nightlights that always stayed on. I got off of the couch and tried to use the power light on the TV to sort of help me to have a point to walk to because my room was the first room in the hall coming out of the living room and when I got to my room and opened the door, there was that man sitting on the edge of my bed now. Now, as terrified as I was, I slowly closed my door back shut, hoping that the man hadn't seen me open the door and I immediately ran to my mum's room screaming and crying again telling her that he was in my room. She gets up and walks with me to my room and again there isn't anything there. I remember just being so confused at that time and questioning what was real and what wasn't. I told my mum that I wanted to go stay with my dad because I was too scared to stay with her anymore. And after contacting my dad I told him everything that had been happening at my mum's. He talked to her and decided that I could come live with him. Talking to my dad about it was really tough too because... He didn't really believe in what I was saying. He also thought that I was just having bad dreams because I was watching scary movies or something at my mother's. But fast forward a few years and my mum is remarried with a man that had three children, the youngest of which was six years old. Over the time that they stayed in the house, the youngest boy started to experience similar things to what I had. When my mum told me that he was saying the same things that I was when I stayed there, I wanted to be like, I told you so. But at this point, my mum believed me and she actually sold the house not long after. Nowadays, we just sort of refer to her old house as the haunted house. It's really hard to talk to other people in person about it though. Because for some reason, it just it makes my eyes water and I just feel terrified even thinking about it. Anyway, I just thought that I would share this here with you guys because, well, it's, it's good to get it off my chest. This happened to my mum about a year ago while she was visiting me. I woke up to get a drink around 4am one night. My mum works third shift so she was still awake and I decided to hang out with her. She told me that she had just got back from the 24-7. When my mum was on her way back from the store though around 3.30am she could see what looked like a person crawling on the road. She rolled her window down and as she got closer she could hear a woman screeching absolute bloody murder. My mum described her as looking like her jaw was about to unhinge. My mum isn't easily fooled, but she wasn't going to just flat out ignore the situation either. She remained in a locked car and yelled out to see if the woman was okay and maybe if she needed the cops. The girl just starts going on about how her parents are after her or something. As the girl is rambling, my mum sees a car coming up from the other direction. My mum yells at her to get out off the road and as she notices the car, she gets up like it's no problem. 
the car passes and then a guy that seems like her boyfriend appears out of nowhere. He's yelling at the girl like, oh babe, I'm glad you're okay. He's saying just random stuff and trying to get her to go with him. She doesn't seem afraid of him, but just as he notices my mum, he's at my mum's window practically instantly. He covered about 20 feet in what seemed like a split second. This whole ordeal was just too strange, so my mum just ended up speeding out of there, and once my mum made it back to my house, she called the police. They told her that they'd actually received one or two calls about this already that night, and they didn't act too concerned. As my mum told me this story, it just made my skin crawl. This all happened about a 10 minute walk from my house at most. I've never had any kind of problem in the three years that I've lived here and nothing even close to this has happened since, but it was a, a strange one, that's for sure. To quickly preface my recent experiences, I believe it's important to know a few things. I'm a 27-year-old female. I've lived in my house going on 13 years now. The house belonged to my maternal grandparents and my family moved in originally to help take care of my ill grandmother. She uh, unfortunately passed away three years ago, but we continue to stay to help take care of my grandfather now. My grandfather is the second person to have ever owned this house. The couple previously, they bought it when it was built in the 70s and only stayed for a few years before moving away. The point of all this being that my house does not have any extensive history since my family has no more or less been the only people to ever live here. But I must admit though that I've never really liked living here. We moved in at the end of my sophomore year of high school and since day one, I've always been just uncomfortable. My home is a breeding ground for negativity. To avoid airing out all the details of my family's personal issues though, I'll just say that tension is always high in my house. People are constantly fighting and mental illness runs rampant in my bloodline too. The air is just thick with aggression and suffocating amounts of stress all the time. It's no surprise to me that paranormal stuff happens here. So... It started out with small things like hearing someone call my name when no one had, finding lights turned on when they were off, seeing things in the corner of my eye, items going missing and then appearing again suddenly, or feeling a sort of cold chill on the back of my neck like someone is behind me but nobody's ever there. Truthfully, I didn't pay too much mind to that stuff. Sure, I found it odd but not creepy enough to keep me up at night or anything. But then, 2013 happened. I started having these sort of insomnia episodes all of a sudden. I've had bouts of insomnia before, but this was different. It was as if my body just wouldn't let me sleep, like it was waiting for something. It started to be that late in the night, I would also smell something burning. And not like that campfire smell or the aroma of cooking, but like something was actively on fire. The first time I smelt it, I jumped up immediately and ran throughout my whole house to check and make sure that it wasn't burning down with everyone unaware. It's a small single floor home with no basement and only a crawl space attic, so I got through it pretty quickly, checking every single room. I touched the walls and I touched the ceilings to feel for any heat, but there was nothing. I looked outside to check neighboring houses in our shed, all the while with the intense smell of fire lingering in the air, but still I didn't see anything. But the smell was so strong I felt like I was choking on it, until suddenly after a few minutes it just disappeared. This continued to happen for weeks straight as well. Every night the smell would come to me, and every night I would begin my routine of checking my house again. I got so paranoid in fact that something was actually going to be on fire that I wouldn't allow myself to just ignore it. I began doing nightly walks around outside of my house to check every possible place for a fire but never saw a thing. Now about two weeks into my nightly walkthroughs I began to notice these sort of small sparks of light on the ceilings that would follow me through the rooms. The light was like um, a dying sparkler, a small burst of brightness that would travel above my head as I walked. The light didn't appear every night and only manifested when I would smell the fire. 
The light also would never follow me into my room when I had completed my nightly rounds. But during this time, the frequency of whispers that I would hear during the day and things going missing increased. And then I began to hear like soft sighs and whimpers outside of my window at random times of the day. Not uh, identifiable as an animal or a person, but once again I would check with no discoveries. These activities, though weighing heavily on my mental well-being, grew mundane and somewhat predictable. Things, however, grew worse in time when I began seeing the people. The first was the little girl in my kitchen. One night, I headed out to grab myself a snack, and as I turned the corner to step into my dark kitchen, the clear figure of a girl stepped directly in front of me in the doorway. Although there were no recognizable features, I knew straight away that she was a child with long hair and wearing a dress from a silhouette. I'm only 4'10", and she was at least a full foot shorter than me. She approached me so closely and so suddenly that I sort of gasped, and I instantly reached for the light switch to my right, and not breaking my eye contact with her dark shape, I watched as she vanished right before me when I flicked the light on. Another was the man that stood in the corner of my room. I only really started noticing him after the little girl. For many nights, I kept him in the corner of my eye, never daring to look directly at him. He wasn't there every night, though, and he wasn't there all the time. He wasn't there until, well, he was. And he was there until, well, he wasn't. What I mean is that there was just no continuity in his appearances. He was only ever there when I was laying in bed, and always only in the far right corner of my room. Eventually, I got the courage to look directly at him. Once again, no distinguishable features other than a masculine build, roughly 5'10 if I had to guess, and he wore a hat, which was weird. When I'm laying down, my feet are sort of in line with the door to my room directly in front of me, but his body was always angled perpendicular, facing the door rather than me. And although his presence did make me nervous, he never really moved. Truthfully, the only one who terrified me was the man at the end of my bed. He frequented more than this little girl, but less than the man in the corner. But one strange thing too about this one is that I always was able to feel him before I saw him. But looking at him made me dizzy, so I tried my best to keep my eyes closed until I felt like he was gone. He was tall, slender, and most distorted out of them all. He always stayed at the foot of my bed though, but it varied if he was directly in front of me or not. Occasionally he would lean over, sometimes a little, sometimes a lot, but he was always just sort of staring at me. I, uh, I really don't like to think about him. It makes my stomach sink and my chest sort of heavy. But for months in the year of 2013, my nights consisted of variations of all these events. A few times, all three even appeared to me on the same night, and only once did the two men appear to me at the same time, but just as quickly as everything had begun, eventually it just stopped. I didn't see them anymore, I didn't smell the fire or see the lights on my ceiling, I always have and probably always will hear the whispers though, but it's obviously 2020 now, and my life has changed well, a lot since then. I put myself through many years of college, I established my career, got a great job, and I've been saving for my future. But something has changed over the last two months. You see, during this pandemic, I've been laid off and have spent the last month and a half almost entirely at home. About three weeks ago, I saw this little girl again, but this time, she was in the reflection of the mirror at the end of my hallway. The mirror is floor to ceiling in length, and although it was during the day, the hallway was dark. And she was just sort of standing behind me in the reflection, but when I turned around, she obviously wasn't there. Twice last week too, a cool shiver was running down the length of my spine, and it woke me instantly from my sleep. Occasionally, I'll feel this presence at the nape of my neck when I walk through my house, and just three nights ago... I saw him again, 
When I sensed him at first, I thought that I was going to pass out. My stomach turned and my vision blurred again. When I finally allowed myself to look, there he was. Only this time, not at the end of my bed where I thought that he was going to be, but on the side of me, and this time, a lot closer. I uh, honestly wanted to cry so badly, but was so frightened that I could only really hold my breath for what seemed like an eternity. And when I had felt that he was gone, I quickly rushed to turn my lights on, and again, there was nobody there. I'm filled with nothing but dread and anxiety. Every night since then, I sleep with my lights on, and even though I'm doing everything in my power not to see them again, I just can't help but notice when they're around. I don't know why they came to me last time, and I don't know why they're coming to me now, but most importantly, I don't know how to make it stop. Do any of you guys have any ideas? As a child, I think kindergarten age, I loved to talk. If anyone had a question for me, I would gleefully give them way too much information. Most people found it endearing and would praise me for being so smart, which often encouraged me a lot. But some people found it annoying, obviously. Now, my mum and I normally shopped at the market just a few minutes away from our house. My mum had been shopping there for like 20 some years at that point, and was friends with most of the workers there. So I was friendly with them too, and always was happy to talk with them. Whenever my mum got distracted talking to someone, I, with the intention span of a six-year-old, would wander around the aisles just looking at things. My mum would keep an eye on me to make sure that I didn't go too far, but if she was distracted, one of the employees would usually be around and gently guide me back over. One day, though, we went to a different market that I couldn't remember having been to before, and we didn't go back for nearly a decade, mind you. We were walking around the aisles when my mum ran into a friend. They started talking and I, not realising that I no longer had a store full of adults, keeping an eye on me that is, started wandering around the aisles. My eyes caught some colourful display, I think flowers or balloons or something, and I went over to look. Once I was satisfied with my inspection, I turned back to the aisle, only to find that my mum wasn't there. Huh, that had never happened before. I looked around a little, though not moving from my spot near the colourful displays. Since it was right near the registers, there was a decent amount of people nearby, which I'm thankful for now. But as I was looking around, an employee came up to me. He was older than my sister, she was 12 or 13 at the time, and younger than my dad, in his mid-40s, which was about the only way that I could gauge the age. But nowadays I would say that he was probably in his early to mid-20s if I remember it correctly. Hi there, he said sweetly in that tone that you normally speak to kids in. I cheerfully said hello, actually stepping a little closer. Hey, are you looking for your mum? I say yes, happily explaining that I had last seen her talking to a friend and that I could normally find her easily when I wandered away, so I wasn't sure where she could have gone. Does she leave you alone often? Not really. My older sister was normally with me if my mum wasn't. She was 12 or 13 and she was super mature, so if my mum had to leave me for a little bit, she knew that I would be okay. Plus, she never really left us alone in public, just at home if she needed to run somewhere. Never for very long too, just the length of time for a Pokemon episode or something. And my dad was at work a lot and didn't come back home until late, usually anyway. Just if you guys were wondering. But then he said, where do you live? And well... Wouldn't you know it, I had just learned my address. We just learned how to mail a letter in school, even took a little class trip to the mailbox in our school corner to send them out. I knew how to write my address now, and I knew how to say it, and want to hear? Of course you do. I know kids are naive, but I was downright dumb at this age. I was diagnosed with colorblindness two years later, otherwise known as red-green colorblindness, it makes sense, as I was totally blind to all the red flags, too. So, where do you go to school, and who picks you up? Well, I go to the local elementary school. I don't know the address, though. Sorry, I tell him. 
but I know what street it's on because I wait on the sidewalk for my mum or daycare sitter depending on the day, so I see the street sign a lot since I'm usually waiting for a while to be grabbed. Hey, do you like animals? Like puppies? But dogs scare me, cats scare me, pigeons scare me, fish scare me, flies scare me. You know what doesn't scare me though? Turtles. I have five turtles. No dogs that might bark or bite if somebody drops by the house, like our neighbour does. Those dogs are always behind the gate though, so they don't scare me that much. But at this stage, it had only been a few minutes since I last saw my mum, even with how much information I was dumping. I was a very fast talker. But I was starting to get a little bit antsy. Not because I was uncomfortable talking to a stranger, but because I had skipped lunch that day, specifically to con my mum into letting me get a bagel from the store next door which was exactly why we were at the market in the first place. My mum was holding onto the bagel to make sure I didn't try to eat it too fast and choke, which I had done several times in the past. And quite frankly, I just wanted my bagel. And while I liked to talk to this grown man who made me feel smart and was oh so interested in my life, I liked bagels a lot more. Plus, if I caught my mum when we were near the bakery section, I might be able to use my charm and cuteness to get a cookie. So I gotta find my mum now. Oh, uh, well, how about I walk around with you and help you find her? You want to lead me through the market that you work at where you can easily bring me to the back room, the meat locker, or any number of places? Yeah, sure, sounds good, I thought. Ozzy! I look around to see my mum, the relieved look on her face slowly changing into something more anxious. I smile happily and I wave her over. She immediately grabs my hand, and I can tell that she wants to chide me, probably for leaving the aisle, but she seems more occupied on the man in front of me. Before I can even open my mouth to introduce him, or remember that I never actually got his name, he quickly says that he's glad that I found my mum and he needs to get back to work, and practically runs to the back of the store. My mum puts her hands on my shoulders and looks me in the eye, her expression a lot more worried now. What was he talking about to you? She asked, her voice more serious than I had ever heard. Can I have my bagel? My mum opens her mouth, pauses, and goes into her purse to hand me my bagel. But between bites, I happily tell her about the conversation and everything that I remembered. My age and grade, my pickup schedule, likes and dislikes, my literal address. And my mum gradually became paler then became red with anger. She brought me over to the manager and I don't really remember much about the conversation but I got a cookie. I remember that pretty well because it was shaped like a watermelon which was apparently far more important to me than paying attention to what was being said. I do remember though that the police weren't called. We went home and my mum told me that I wasn't allowed to walk around the store anymore like that. No more talking to any strangers even if they worked at the store that we were at unless she was with me that was. If I ever was to see that man again, I was to run away, find someone that I know and ask for help. And if all else fails, scream at the top of my lungs, just like when a fly lands on me. By the way, I still hate insects. I agree pleasantly, not really fazed by anything that she's saying. I know that some people are bad, of course, but bad people look bad, right? They talk mean and look scary and try to grab you this man he didn't so he wasn't bad to me but if my mum was saying it then I guess I had no choice but to listen and I better enjoy that cookie because we apparently weren't going back to that store ever again tears incoming in exchange though I can get a donut once a month from our usual store tears cancelled when I was around 12, our school had a safety assembly and was talking about the shady things that adults do to get close to kids, and a very, very watered down version of what they most likely wanted. And I'm sitting there listening, and suddenly realize, oh, if my mum hadn't have found me, something really terrible might have happened. If not in the store, then in front of my school. And if not in front of my school, then perhaps even at my house. A little over a decade now, I'm 18 now, and I've never seen the guy again. Not even at that store, which 
is odd because we went back there a couple of times and I don't think he actually worked there. When I was nine, my parents bought a derelict or abandoned farm deep in the woods of Sweden. This wasn't the first time my parents had done this either. My parents had just sold the first farm after they made the farm livable. And I must admit that I was sad to part with it, but I did look forward to a whole new world of adventure and discoveries on the new one. Nothing spooky ever really happened on the first farm. I was never really scared of the old house or the woods around it. I could be alone for hours in the woods, in fact, just playing and making dens for picnics with my imaginary adventure team and all that sort of stuff. But something changed, though, when we bought the second farm. The first couple of times we came to paint and build on the house, nothing ever happened. I was just exploring the different buildings in the woods around us. This farm had like four buildings, the main house, a garage, a stable, and we never found out where the fourth building was. It was badly damaged after it had been burned down or something. But at the time, I was really into horses, and I was always in the stables. And I think that we had owned the house for about a year when the first thing happened. So I was playing in the stable, just with some hay, when I suddenly felt like someone had their hands around my neck and squeezed. I couldn't breathe and I instantly ran out of the stable and as soon as I saw my mum I could breathe again but I was coughing and wheezing and I just couldn't stop. I tried to explain what was happening but my throat hurt so much that I just kept coughing. My mum rushed me inside the house and got me some water. I was still coughing and gasping after 15 minutes so my mum decided to drive me to the hospital while my dad stayed with my brothers. I eventually stopped coughing, of course, and nobody could really understand what happened. Just for your information, too, before the next part. Up until I was 14, I never had any allergies, and I had my first asthma attack when I was like 13. The reason I mention this is because the next episode was written off as just an asthma attack. Looking back and now knowing what an actual asthma attack felt like, I just call bullcrap on this one. But anyway... After that whole thing, I stopped playing in the stable and I opted for playing in the woods with my brothers. And the next thing that happened was when I was about 11. I had woken up in the middle of the night to hear somebody walking around. I stood up from my bed and walked past my parents who were sleeping in the same room. I went to the kitchen and I saw a black figure just standing in the middle of the kitchen. Had I not looked closely, I probably would have just walked by it thinking that it was my dad but I sort of just froze because something came over me and I turned around and walked straight back to my bed. I couldn't sleep though and to be honest I felt like somebody was staring at me all night. I told my parents the next day that I saw a man in the kitchen but they told me that I was probably just dreaming. I probably was dreaming but after seeing that figure I always felt like I just wasn't welcome and always felt eyes on me at all times. One occurrence, though, left me just terrified of this house, and I begged my parents to leave me with my grandparents whenever they went to the farm after this. So one day, I was just on my computer chatting with some online friends and playing a game. My parents wanted to go grocery shopping and asked if I wanted to come too. I declined, being really into my game at the time, and they asked me if I was sure. But I nodded, and they left me with my brothers. And immediately I regretted not going as soon as that door slammed shut because a feeling of just terror overcame me. I was scanning the whole room that I was in, scared to find something that I shouldn't have. The car had already pulled onto the dirt road and out of sight by now. The sound of the car drifted away and I was left in terror and just in silence. The silence somehow grew louder and louder until it was deafening and... All of a sudden, I felt a pop in my ears. I was shaking and my teeth were chattering. I was so scared. But then, I heard a tap. And then another one and another one. The taps were in a predictable rhythm. And I knew it was at least two hours until my family came home since the grocery store was miles away. And I had to endure it. But something sent me running out of the house. Because... In the doorway to the kitchen, I saw a figure sort of stalking towards me. This time, I knew that it wasn't a dream too. 
My lungs felt like they were being crushed and I began getting an instant headache. I stared at the figure for a good five seconds. Then, in pure shock, I sprinted out of the back door and towards the dirt road. I was thankful that I was still wearing my flip-flops after eating breakfast outside and I ran up the dirt road aiming to get help from the neighbors who lived about a 20-minute walk away. I didn't expect to see our car come down the road, but I walked to the side of the road and my parents hopped out and asked what happened. I burst out crying and so they put me in the car. I refused to go inside the house again, but my parents thought that I just made it all up and they told me that I was paranoid. But I stand by what I saw and years later I still hate that farm. I've only visited once since after that, but never again, because whatever is on that farm specifically hates me. I just have one thing, though, that has been bothering me a lot. How long was I frozen in place? Because, like I said, it takes hours for us to go grocery shopping, and it felt like what happened was in the span of maybe five or ten minutes. To be honest, though, I, I don't even know if I want to know. I'm just happy that I don't ever have to go back there again. So I was 15 years old, but there was some stuff that I was going through. My parents were recently divorced, depression problems, but nothing truly awful, I guess. It was late. I was dealing with some pretty bad insomnia, too. I was texting my best friend, who I don't talk to much anymore, partially because of this, I think, too. I can't remember what we were talking about, but I remember looking over at the corner of my room and just seeing a tall shadow there, about six to seven feet tall. I freeze, obviously, and I'm thinking to myself, okay, shadow, tree shadow? There's a tree outside, there must be. I slowly turn my head to look out the window, and there's no way the tree can be casting this shadow. There's just too much wind. I look back over at it, and it's still a very still shadow. I text my friend, Lynn, there's something in my room, and I'm very scared. I'm getting really bad feelings from it. And directly after I send the text, the shadow just dissipates. Like, kind of just fades away, as does the feeling of dread, too. Lynn texts me back, there's something here too, a really tall shadow in the corner of my room and I'm freaking out. Her bedroom had no window, so there's no way that she could mistake it for a tree shadow. And a few minutes after I get the text, I feel that sense of dread returning. There is the shadow again, standing at the foot of my bed this time. It was way too dark to get a photo and I honestly was not thinking about pictures at that time. I was completely terrified. My breathing gets super labored and I feel a panic attack coming on when all of a sudden my phone battery drops from 80-ish to zero and dies. Panic attack comes on strong at this point and I jump for my phone charger next to my bed. I plug my phone in looking for the shadow that I took my eyes off of for maybe a second but it's gone. The phone comes back on and jumps right back up to where it was before it died. I keep it plugged in just in case. And I text Lynn, I think it killed my phone battery, what the hell, I'm scared. About 10 minutes later, she replies, it was standing next to my bed, it was all black and I'm scared. It killed my phone battery too, but it's fine now, it's gone again though. So, I start putting it together. There's a few minutes between jumps, it seems to be following the text or something. I start texting anyone and everyone that I can, just random bullcrap, how are you, been a while, are you okay, etc. Maybe I can confuse it or stretch it out or something. But holy smokes, that was a terrible idea. My bed instantly starts shaking violently, my headboard is banging the wall and my blankets get ripped straight off the bed. I can see it standing tall at the foot of my bed and I have a fight or flight reaction at this point and jump off my bed towards my bedroom door and the light switch. As I'm leaping over to the door, I feel a really cold hand touch my ankle, almost pulling me back towards my bed. I yank open my door and turn my light on at the same time and it flickers for a moment, temporarily blinding me and the bulb just shatters everywhere. I scream and I run across the hall to my mum's room where I start sobbing. 
and she has the audacity to just laugh at me. I'm freaking out, scared of this demon monster shadow thing in my room that blew my light bulb, and she laughs at me. I get angry, and I tell her that I'm not sleeping in there tonight unless I get a new bulb. She promises to buy me a new bulb the next day, and gives me the mag light and tells me to sleep in the living room. So, I creep into my bedroom to grab my phone charger, and just run to the living room and turn the lights all on. After a few days, I start sleeping in my bedroom again, but I had to get a new bulb and sleep with the flashlight for a long time after that. So yeah, Lynn refuses to talk about it. Nobody else experienced it, and nobody ever believes me. It's horrible too, but I still can't walk to my bed in the dark without feeling that hand on my ankle. This happened about two years ago after going to see a movie with a group of my friends. So I live in a small town. The nearest decent movie theater is about 40 minutes away, I think. I'm always the driver because my car is the most functional for those long distances, and I'm also kind of a softie when it comes to doing favors for others. This also means that I'm always the last one to get home for the night, and it's usually very early in the morning when I finally do get home. So this specific night, it was pretty late when we got back. Like I said, it's a small town, so when it gets late, the roads are pretty much dead. There's an order that I drop everyone off in, the furthest from my house to the closest, logically. We're pretty spread out though from each other. If you've ever been to a rural town, then you'll know that there's a lot of twists and turns on back roads like that. But I dropped off one of my sad friends, and there was only my boyfriend left. I drove towards my boyfriend's house and stopped at a T-intersection along the way. The road in front of us was lit with streetlights, but the further you looked down either side of the road, it was dark. There were no cars anywhere, as I expected, so I turned onto the road and headed towards my boyfriend's house. But not even a minute down the road, I saw headlights in my rearview mirror. I don't know when they'd shown up, but I remember noticing them because the headlights looked like the ones on a friend's car. But there were four lights all around, and arranged like the corners of a trapezoid. For a moment, too, I thought it could be my friend, because the lights were so distinct. But the vehicle looked a bit larger, and I just brushed it off and continued driving. But we were on one of the main roads, so it didn't surprise me when they continued to follow behind us as we went. After a little while, I turned onto a back road that was pretty hilly, but it was the shortest way to my boyfriend's house and the vehicle turned onto that road as well. It still wasn't that weird. I mean, my boyfriend lives on one of an assortment of ranch houses, so we've had a lot of people follow behind us to that section of the town and then eventually taper off in their separate driveways. But they were pretty far behind us as well, so again, I just didn't think much of it. Sure enough, though, they just kept taking every turn that we took. The closer we got, too, my boyfriend and I even began to joke about how long they'd been behind us. And it was only when we turned into his driveway that we finally grew concerned. Now, he has a long driveway that goes up a hill. I reached the top and could see the vehicle slowing down at the end of his driveway. And then it turned in and began to slowly drive up. Very slowly too. My boyfriend and I sat in my car looking at each other because we didn't know what the hell was going on. As it got closer though, we went through every possible person that it could have been. We even considered my sister, who could have recognized my car and wanted to scare us. It was a reach, since no one we brought up owns a car that looks like that, but I was praying that that was the answer. They reached the top and parked maybe 10 feet behind me, and then they turned off their headlights and just sat there. It was too dark to be able to make out what kind of car it was. I kept turning in my seat trying to see if someone was walking around or if I could catch a glimpse at their vehicle. We sat there for a long time too trying to figure out what the hell was happening. We didn't dare step out of the car and I kept the engine running in case I needed to make a break for it. Although they were parked directly behind me blocking the driveway. I'm not sure how long we sat there for but it was a good while that just nothing happened. And then I heard a creaky door open and shut. I instinctively pressed the lock button on my door, even though my car was already locked, and I watched as a middle-aged or older man came into view on my side mirror. 
As I watched him step closer, I leaned away from the window towards my boyfriend in the passenger seat, and the man walked up to my window. He had a pretty big gut, and his silver hair was pulled into a ponytail underneath a red cap. He cupped his hands and peered into my car, and I still remember him looking right at me so vividly. His expression was blank, and I couldn't even move. Then he stood up, he pointed back towards his vehicle, said something that I couldn't hear, and then just turned around and left. He didn't turn his headlights back on until he reached the road, and when he turned... I could see the dark outline of a truck bed. My boyfriend and I sat there stunned for a long time. My boyfriend and his stepdad drove behind me to my house to make sure no one followed me there either. He hugged me before I went inside and said that he'd give me an update the next day. No one really could explain it or knew who he was. I haven't seen a similar truck since then, but if I notice a car that's been following me for a while, no matter what it looks like... I make sure to take an extra few turns away from my house until they've turned on a different road these days. I really can't help the sneaking suspicion too that things may have gone a lot differently if my boyfriend wasn't in the car with me. So I'm 19 and have lived in several different houses in my lifetime. But there were two places that I lived where you could tell that something was just very clearly wrong. One was a trailer where I had a few encounters involving doorknobs forcefully jostling and hearing strange noises. I was also plagued by nightmares and hallucinations, but I'm going to be talking about the worst house that I've lived in. The one that still fills me with anxiety thinking about it, even after I haven't lived there in like five years. This is the only time that I've ever seen the full manifestation of a spirit or whatever you call them and I hope that it's the last time too. So we moved into this two-story house when I was nine years old. Ever since arriving I could already feel that something just wasn't completely right. But while the trailer was filled with a very heavy tumultuous energy this house was just the complete opposite. It was just bleak and still. It was an unnerving quiet, and any room that I walked in made me anxious to escape, though the bottom floor was definitely far worse. I spent most of my time in my room on the second floor at the end of the hall, and I only felt safe downstairs when it was daylight, and even then, I was nervous if I was completely alone on the first floor. While living in this house, I slowly devolved into one of the worst depressive states that I've ever been in at age 12. I stopped caring about school, my health, sleep, pretty much everything in fact. I would frequently find myself waiting until the night before to write essays. My family computer was downstairs in the dining room. My parents' room was right beside the staircase, so I wasn't able to turn on any lights as I snuck down. I just used a flashlight on my phone. I can remember being paralyzed with fear descending those stairs into the dark first floor, but I couldn't run out of fear that I'd be caught by my parents. I completed my papers as fast as I could with only the light of my computer to see in the dining room and I just remember feeling like I was going to die down there sometimes. I would also hear the occasional noise and I would whip around to figure out if it was my parents or something else and it was never my parents. I don't really know why I kept procrastinating schoolwork just to end up forcing my body through such extreme anxiety. I just wasn't in a good place, that's for sure. Somehow, though, it was harder to get back up the stairs than it was writing an entire paper downstairs. I really don't know what was so different about the landing of the staircase, but I absolutely hated crossing that threshold. In fact, I would walk upstairs backwards with my phone flashlight pointed down the stairs, so agonizingly slow that I'm surprised I managed to cling the threads of my sanity that I had. And I'm really not sure how old I was when... I saw the apparition of the house. It was when I didn't have school though, so I was allowed to stay up at this point. I was downstairs with my sister playing video games until it was around midnight. We had all the lights on. My sister said something about going to her room and for some reason I thought that she was going to come back downstairs. I played alone for a while before I realized that she must have left me alone. I was hit with that familiar anxiety and I decided that it was just time to go upstairs. Now, let me describe the layout of our first floor. 
There weren't any doors down there, only openings in each wall, so you could walk in a circle around the staircase, which was in the middle. The living room was the biggest room and had an open floor where you could see the landing of the staircase across the room. On the other side of the staircase was a den that you could also walk through to go upstairs. The kitchen and the dining room were connected to each other and separated from the staircase. There were multiple light switches too for each room, so before going upstairs, I would usually start at the den and circle around the kitchen and dining room to the living room, turning off each light. Then I would turn off the last light and just make a mad dash through the living room for the stairs. This night wasn't that much different too. I was trying not to make myself scared because I honestly just wanted to go upstairs and go to my room, so I did things as casually as I could. I started in the den, turned off the light, then the kitchen, then the dining room, then the living room and walked around in a circle. Only this time, when I turned off the living room light and looked ahead, I swear to you that I saw a woman. There was a faint light coming from a cause decal that my stepdad had hung up at the top of the stairs. And she just looked so solid and real. The light created shadows on her face and there she was, just standing on the landing of the staircase, in what looked like a nightgown, I think. The core sign made her skin look blue. She had short, shaggy black hair, but her face wasn't obscured. I could see her eyes, but they were heavily sunken, though the dim light probably didn't help. Her nose was thin and upturned, but I'll never forget her smile. It wasn't a big toothy grin with bloody fangs or anything. She just had a slight upturn to her lips, but I couldn't tell if it was smug or kind. The thing I remember most though was that I could see the space that she occupied. I could see her standing behind the railing of the stairs and I could see her swaying slightly in her place. I was completely frozen in the doorway, obviously, in between the dining room and the living room. My hand hadn't even left the light switch before I saw her. I was afraid to make even the smallest movement. It felt like it all happened within an instant too. I was terrified of what was about to happen to me if I looked away even for a moment. And somehow I mustered the bravery to move my finger and flip the living room light back on. And at that moment, she disappeared with the darkness. I can remember continuing to stare at that spot that she had been in, looking for some sort of shape that I could have imagined was her. I was just cemented to my spot. While at the light switch, I turned the dining room light back on, and feeling a little safer now, glanced at the clock. And apparently, I had been standing there for a full 30 minutes. I absolutely panicked, and I turned all of the downstairs lights on, even the laundry room. But the whole time I knew that I would have to turn them all off again, and I would have to go back upstairs. That's where I knew that I would be safe. I knew I had to go there, but to do that, I would have to pass through the landing where the woman had just been standing. Just thinking about it absolutely terrified me too. I spent nearly an hour just pacing downstairs going back and forth between the living room and the den to glance at the staircase. I kept wondering if there was another way that I could get back up the stairs, but there just wasn't. I finally just said screw it though and decided to push through. I wasn't going to spend all night trapped down there with her, malevolent spirit or not. I did the same as before, turning off each light in a circle before stopping at the living room. I took a deep breath before turning off the living room light, and she wasn't there. I made a run for it, thinking to myself, just get through it, just get to the top and get through it. The landing was absolutely freezing too. And as I got closer, I felt like something was reaching straight through me and trying to steal the life from me or something. I latched onto the rail and swung myself around and onto the stairs with such urgency, I'm surprised that I didn't fall on my face. I clambered onto the stairs and crawled on my hands and feet as fast as I could. I didn't care who I woke up at this point, I needed to escape. I got to the top faster than I thought I could and sprinted to my room and just slammed the door and locked it too for ghost precaution I suppose. I laid in my bed trying not to picture her in my room but she was behind my eyelids every time that I tried to go to sleep. I moved out of that house when I was 14 and into the trailer. There was a different kind of haunting experience there but nothing will terrify me as much as that house. 
Any time that I begin to question my beliefs, I remember this moment too, and I trust myself and my experiences, and I know what I saw that night was absolutely real. It was such a powerful encounter, and it immediately erased any doubts that I have regarding the existence of spirits. And to be quite honest, I don't think that I'll ever forget her. So I have a friend who has just recently been getting into these entitled parent stories on Reddit. We eventually started talking about them and would laugh at the sheer stupidity of Darwin's failed experiments. Until last week, that is. She began to be uh, more and more quiet and eventually I finally pressed her and she revealed that she's been coming across some of the stories of attempting kidnappings and they reminded her of a night years ago. After telling me what happened too, we're both still not sure if this is the right place for it, but it's a story that if someone would ever find themselves in a similar situation, they may get some ideas to protect themselves. So anyway, many moons ago in the early 2000s, my friend Sarah was going to the local state college. Now, while the college was in the city, she lived out in the country with her father and would use the bus system to go to and from school. One afternoon after class, her and her friends went to one of their apartments to study for some exams. And well, being the young and responsible young adults that they were, studied for maybe 10 minutes tops before things turned to a more festive gathering. After a few hours though, Sarah happened to glance at the clock, which caused her mind to snap, Hey, what time does the last bus run? Screaming profanities and prayers warding off her demise by her father, she quickly ran to the bus stop just in time to catch its final trip of the night. But with a huge sigh of relief, she flopped down in a seat in the back and threw her headphones on. Lost in thoughts of what elaborate tales to tell her father, she hadn't noticed a little boy walking up to her until she noticed movement out of the corner of her eye as he sat down beside her. She somehow managed not to recoil at the sight of the child because while the child was completely filthy and reminded her of someone from Deliverance, it was his creepy smile that she remembered most. He just sat there too, smiling at her until she slowly slid her headphones down and the following began. Uh, hello? Hi. Uh, hello. You're pretty. Uh, well, thank you. What's your name? Now, Sarah had this policy of never giving any personal info to strangers, but kids were usually harmless in her opinion. But every alarm was going off in her head, so she said, uh, My name's Katie. That's a nice name. Well, I like it. And then the kid just sat there, smiling at her. After like a few minutes of smiling, the kid finally said, You would make a great mum, you know and hopped down and walked back to an even more dirty and unkempt monster of a man, whom she could only assume was the boy's father. Because just like his son, he was just smiling at her. When she looked at him, he nodded politely and just kept smiling too. She put her headphones back on and dug out a book to pretend to study, but she kept looking back and noticed both of them just smiling right at her. As each stop came up and went, she prayed that they would get off, but as the bus began to empty of other passengers, she soon found out that it was just her, some middle-aged woman, and those two. The bus was beginning to slow now for its next stop in a small town that had a series of restaurants. She couldn't take them anymore too, and decided that it was safer for her to go to the McDonald's and wait for her father there than sit on the bus any longer. So, she gathered her things and prepared to disembark. As she followed the woman to pass, she noticed the man was gathering their things as well. And she thought, hell no. But she didn't want to make it out like she was trying to avoid them, so she moved to the seat near the front and sat back down. To her horror, she watched as the man and his son took another seat and sat back down too, still smiling at her and nodding. Her anxiety was through the roof at this point as she watched more stops come and go until her stop was coming up. I mean, what was she going to do? Her mind was racing, but as the bus came to a stop, she gathered her things again and watched in horror as the men gathered their things as well. And instead of getting off, she sat back down again behind the driver this time. Uh, excuse me, how much further until the end of the line? 
Uh, three more stops. Sarah then leaned in and told the driver about the man and her son and asked if it was possible to have the police there when they arrived. The driver looked in the mirror and then told her that he'd take care of it. Sarah glanced back and her heart jumped into her throat as while the little boy was still smiling at her, the father wasn't anymore. She described it as a look a parent gives their child when they've done something wrong and a wait till we get home kind of thing. Now, Sarah was usually a very strong individual, but she was in tears at this point as she took out her phone and tried to call her father, and there was only voicemail. Who else could she call? Well, she finally decided to call her ex. He may have been a disloyal piece of crap, but she could always rely on him when it counted most. As quietly as she could, she poured her heart out about what was happening and asked if he could meet them at the last stop. I'm at Rogers right now and it's about 20 minutes to get there, but I'll get there as fast as I can, alright? Please, hurry, okay? She begged. Finally, they came over the hill to where the final stop was. Frantically, she looked for something, anything that could help her, but there was nothing. Finally, the bus pulled in and the door swung open. The man glared down at her, waiting for her to get off first. Now, hold up, miss. I need to talk to you about your bus pass. The man stood there for a moment until the driver told him that this was the last stop and he needed to get off. I'm waiting for my... Sir, you need to get off. If you're waiting for her, she'll be here along shortly, but I need you to get off now, alright? Angrily, the man stomped off with his child in tow. As soon as they got off, the driver shut the door too. What the... The man began yelling and banging on the door, and Sarah was scared that he was going to break the glass until she noticed two police cars pulling in, followed shortly by the little piece of crap Jack drove. The police ordered the man away, and she couldn't hear what was being said, but Jack later revealed that the man was claiming that Sarah was his daughter, and he was taking her home. Once Jack asked him her name, and he said Katie, that was all she wrote. In the end, the man got into a fight with Jack and the officers, but was finally arrested. When she got home and told her father what happened, he tossed her the keys to his old 82 Ram, and she was never to ride the bus again. And while it was loud and a bit of a pain to drive, she never felt safer. But she did ride the bus one final time after that, when she delivered a plate of cookies to the driver who clearly saved her life. About a year ago, I was working at a local credit union as a call center rep. Basically, my job was to answer phone calls that came from the outside and either perform a banking service over the phone after asking a series of identifying questions, or direct the calls to where they needed to go. I wasn't really fond of the job, as it came to be incredibly tedious and more often than you would think, there were definitely creepers on the other line looking to entertain themselves if you know what I mean. I'll tell you just for context too that though being a call center rep sounds easy, it's not usually, especially when working for a financial institution. You're expected to identify a person in very particular manners over the phone perfectly each time and you take about 80 to 100 calls a day. You're expected to pretty much know every answer possible with little to no help from management or other departments, even if the questions asked had nothing to do with the call center department's skill set. Often, too, you'll handle requests from members that can potentially put accounts at risk, so you need to be diligent and on your toes on every single call. It's also important, too, that I note that at the call center I worked at, it was not accessible to the public, ever. We had to swipe special badges to get in and out of the building, and there were multiple door points that you had to enter or leave the building through. But anyway, one particular winter day, I had been scheduled 11am to 7.45pm. It was a long and grueling shift, especially because most phone calls came in between those hours. The lucky ones would have left for the day at about 4.30pm, just when the calls were beginning to pick up. I had made it through all of my shift with little to no issues, other than the usual nonsensical calls, save for some incredibly stressful wire transfers that I had to make over the phone. 7.25pm rolled around just as scheduled and I was getting ready to place myself in the research auxiliary to signal that I was done with my calls for the evening when my phone rang. Rolling my eyes, I picked up the call hesitantly 
and as soon as I hit the green answer button, I remember feeling my stomach drop with a regret. Like, I should have just let it go to the answering service or something. On the other end, I was immediately met with the sound of heavy breathing. I remember hearing my pre-recorded greeting play over my headset. Hello, thank you for calling the contact center. This is Brit, with whom do I have the pleasure of speaking with today? And as soon as my recorded greeting ended, I was hit with rapid fire questions by a man. At first, they were normal run of the mill banking questions. How much is in my checking account? Did this bill come out of the account today? Is my payroll scheduled to come into my account on Friday? I answer all of his simple questions as quickly and politely as possible. But then the questions just got weird. Like, what is the interest rate on my checking account? If you know anything about finance, you know that the interest you accrue on your checking is pretty much slim to none. Pennies a month, if that. So, it definitely was not a question that I was ever asked, even after working there full-time for a year at this point. Taken aback by the question, though, I gave him the answer. There was a long pause, and the next questions he asked still haunt me to this day, because I have no idea why he would possibly need to know these things. What is the temperature right now? Outside, I asked. No, of the room you're in right now. To which I respond, um, I'm not sure, standard room temperature? He made an annoyed sound and then asked another invasive question. Where are you located? Are you located on? And he named the correct road the call center was actually on. And at this point, I was definitely feeling a little bit freaked out. I'm a paranoid person in general, but these questions, they just didn't feel right. I tried to convince myself that he could just be maybe multitasking or even under the influence or something. My paranoid self tried to professionally throw him off the trail that I suspected that he could be on. Uh, yeah, that's where the call center is located, but it's not accessible to the public. If you'd like, I can direct you to the closest branch to you based on your address. He ignored me and asked me this last question. What time do you employees leave the building you're in? I replied, We stopped taking calls around 7.30pm, uh, but I can't actually tell you what time the employees leave. Sorry. He ignored my answer and began asking descriptive questions rapid fire, like, How tall are you? How old are you? What's your last name? Startled, I began to say that I couldn't list that information for security purposes, but before I could get my last word out, he just disconnected the call. I remember shutting down my system and telling my cubicle neighbor about the conversation and just explaining that it felt off. Unfortunately, my co-worker dismissed what I had to say as just another loony member of the bank and we giggled a little bit about it but I was still panicked and had trouble catching my breath. As typically we are required to stay another 15 minutes to help managers close shop if necessary, I used that time to go to the restroom and take a breath as I still didn't feel put at ease. When I went back to my desk to get my things to leave, my parking lot buddy was waiting for me. Luckily, we had a bit of a buddy system in place as it was pretty much pitch black outside and my job had one mere lamppost that barely lit the parking lot. My co-worker and I headed for the door. Between the outside of our area that the call center was on, there are five sets of secure doors. It sounds excessive, but it's because financial institutions need to be incredibly secure, especially the center point of the bank. The call center was where everything was kept, which was again why the public was not allowed inside. I was just about to swipe my badge through the last set of doors and step outside when one of my supervisors came running behind us and slammed into me. Startled, my co-worker asked him what he was doing. He blocked the door with his body, not allowing my co-worker or I to leave. With a frantic look in his eyes, he said, Do not leave. We just received a call from the police that there's a man in tattered clothes walking around the building with a knife looking into the windows. I have them on the line and they'll tell me when it's safe. I don't remember saying anything else but bringing up the call to my co-worker and saying that I knew something just didn't feel right. After a solid 45 minutes of waiting for the coast to be clear, the suspect was taken into custody by police. On the way to my car, I walked by the police car that held him, and I could clearly see him through the window as the police car windows weren't tinted. I don't think I'll ever forget the look on his face too as I passed him because he gave me the creepiest grin. 
His eyes were just so dead and it was as if his mouth was trying to make up for the lack of emotion his eyes had. It still gives me chills to this day just thinking about it. The next day, I talked to the manager who had frantically stopped us from leaving the night before and he told me that the guy had been arrested with the intent of kidnapping. Basically, when the police looked into the guy's background, he had said that the bank that I was working for had repossessed his car and his house and his wife had left him as a result. He was charged with the intent of kidnapping because the cops found questionable items on him when he was arrested. In the trunk of his car were three bundles of rope, a box of medical grade gloves, a hacksaw and duct tape which was parked in the back lot of the call center. He was also wielding a six inch knife when he was arrested. Reflecting on it a bit, I don't think he was directly intending on coming after me specifically, but it sounds as though he was looking for any call center employee to take hostage and who knows what else. Immediately after this, I brought the weird phone call to my management, the risk mitigation department and the security team too. Unfortunately, the call wasn't really taken seriously by my job though. I don't even think they looked into the call. Even though I feel in my gut my phone call and this situation were definitely connected, I wonder a lot about what would have happened if the police hadn't been tipped off about this guy running around the building with all those items in his possession. I still have a lot of unanswered questions, but I'll never forget the bad gut feeling that I got that day. It's important to listen to those, no matter how ridiculous they can seem at the time. This is pretty recent and happened last Friday and it's still rattling about in my assistant's mind and I can't blame her. Obviously, I'm still thinking about it as well. We have a client who we set up with one of our more seasoned caregivers considering it didn't take long to realize that she needs more help than most. This client is a, an overall sweetheart really. She's a pianist with a rich history. My favorite story of hers is how she hitched a ride across country to go see Jimi Hendrix live in CA. However, she has the kind of anxiety that's difficult to handle for some. The kind that leads to four hour-long calls in a day of panic sobs and screams because she wasn't sure when she could get the soap. In the past month, she's had the fire and the police department visit her roughly nine times as well. Not because she fell or was hurt either, but because she needed reassurance. Apartment management was not happy about this, obviously, and this client refuses to even entertain the idea of assisted living. So, sirens it is. Because of this, I and my assistant have been keeping a close watch on the client through the reports our caregiver types up in her documentation at the end of a shift. And we notice that things seem to be getting worse for the clients, mentally. I feared Alzheimer's. One report read of how the client would complain about a blind man living in her apartment with her. She was upset because, well, she had not agreed to share her apartment. I remember thinking that this was the mark of the end. She was just getting worse. Last Friday, my assistant was covering the shift for this client's caregiver since the caregiver was out of town. I was already home on call when I got a call from my assistant. Hey, sorry to bother you, but I got a question if you have a minute. Uh, sure, go for it, I said. So I'm at the client's house and she buzzed me in, right? But when I got to the apartment and knocked on the door, no one answered. It's locked and totally silent. What do you want me to do? That kicked me in the gut. I was positive that she fell. The few times that I went over there and knocked on the door, she'd have a panic and scream on the other side for me to just hold on a damn second. Okay, go find the landlord and have them get maintenance to let you in. She might have fell. Uh, the main office is empty, but I'll look around for them. Alright, call me back with an update though. If you don't find them, we're going to have to call 911 to be safe. My hope was that she just fell back asleep or was so panicked that she couldn't bring herself to the door. Anything but a fall. An hour or so passed when my assistant finally called me back with an update. It was a fall. She was found in her bathroom, pantless and covered in dry hard feces. My assistant found her in a state of delirium. She didn't know where she was, who she was. The paramedics were called immediately. According to them, judging by the state that she was in and how old the feces were, she'd been down there for a few days. They told my assistant that had the client not been found, 
she would have been dead the very next day. My assistant offered to clean the mess. Crap was everywhere in the bathroom, but the apartment management had people coming in to take care of it. I couldn't remember the details of that part, but what I can't seem to forget is what my assistant told me that she did next. She was confused. She was wondering how she was buzzed in. To buzz someone in, you need to enter the connected phone and press zero. But there were no phones near the client. She listened to the other line ring for a good 15 to 30 seconds before she was buzzed in. But how? I asked her if management let her up. Sometimes they take pity on us and just ring us in. But no, they weren't in the building. She said they were literally just walking in as I was walking on the elevator on the first floor to find them. She told me she found the phones though, all three of them, lined up on an end table in the client's living room next to the client's favorite chair. My guess is that it must have just been a glitch in the tech. My assistant thinks that it was fate pulling strings, a higher power that led her in that day. We've discussed it every day since. My assistant told me that she hasn't stopped thinking about it since it happened, and she's baffled as to how she even got in, even with her beliefs. I don't care for a why anymore in this instant. The client is in recovery, and I accept and I'm grateful for that. And that's the end of this story. She is alive. My cousin moved back into town a little over a year ago, I want to say maybe April or June of 2018. She has three kids and the youngest is a five-year-old girl. After they had moved into their new place and were finally settled in after a few weeks, I went to visit along with some other family members. We had an overall good time, a lot of good food and whatnot, and after dinner, I remember my little cousin, who was four at that time, wanted to play that cootie game. It was in her room upstairs and she needed someone to go with her because she was afraid of something. I put it up to her being in a new environment and still getting used to the house. So naturally, as an adult, I prepared to fight off any escaped Monsters Inc. characters so she could get her game. We got to her room and she refused to even set foot in it. And I asked something along the lines of, is there a bad thing in here? She nodded and pointed to the game and I went to grab it. And she told me to be careful in that corner of her room. I asked why and she says, that's where the screaming lady is. She's on fire and screaming a lot. I don't like her. Hearing this makes my heart drop into my gut like a lead anvil. I quickly grabbed the game and we just went downstairs at that point. As soon as we were back in the living room, my cousin returned to her normal cheery self and we played some cooties. Later on that night, I asked her mother, my first cousin, if she knew about this screaming lady that her daughter told me about. She said that her daughter refused to sleep in her room until they make the lady go away and has come to sleep in her parents' bed just about every night since they moved in. No one else has had any weird experiences in the house since moving in, but this four-year-old girl is beyond terrified on a nightly basis. Well... A month or so passes and I don't really hear much more about any spooky experiences so I eventually come to the conclusion that my cousin was simply having very specific reoccurring night terrors or something like that. Cut to yesterday evening though. It was the birthday for another one of my cousin's kids so I stopped over to bring him the new Fire Emblem game for the Nintendo Switch. I usually stop over a few times a week to hang out since it's not far from my workplace. So today, being my cousin's birthday, didn't make my stopping over a rare occurrence or anything like that. We ended up playing some of it. We played some Mario Kart and played some Super Smash Bros. And everything just went pretty well. That is, until later on in the evening. We were waiting for a pizza to arrive and I was in the kitchen grabbing some soda with my cousin whose birthday it was. When out of nowhere, we both pick up on the very distant smell of burning. My cousin and her husband came out of the living room in the kitchen, thinking that we had cooked and burned something, but obviously we hadn't. And the house just filled up with this smell. And if I were blind, I would have guessed that I was right next to a massive bonfire, minus the heat. During this time, my youngest cousin, now five, was taking a nap on the couch in the living room. She suddenly starts yelling for her mum, who goes in to check on her, 
Everyone else follows and she's inconsolably crying and screaming saying, I can hear the screaming lady in my room. I hear her screaming. So basically, everyone had that same lead anvil heart dropping in the gut moment that I had last year. We went up to her room with her mum staying with her, but when we got there, we saw nothing. But the smell of burning had changed from that of a bonfire to only what I can guess a person smells like when they burn. A heavy waft of just burning hair smell, followed by some other burning smell that I honestly hadn't experienced in my entire life thus far. We quickly went back downstairs and told her mother what we had experienced and she decided for us to all go outside to the front porch or patio area until the pizza arrived. My little cousin was still hysterical, saying that she didn't want to hear the lady screaming anymore. We tried to calm her and eventually she seemed to settle down a bit, still scared but not screaming and crying anymore. We continued to sit there for maybe 10 minutes. My two other younger cousins and I were comparing our Pokemon Go collections and my youngest cousin and her parents were watching some kid-friendly YouTube stuff to distract her. When out of nowhere, everyone hears the most blood-curdling, terrifying and loud scream come from inside of the house's second floor. It must have lasted for maybe 15 or so seconds straight, just multiple long, horrible screams. And after that moment, everything just went dead quiet. My five-year-old cousin went back to throwing a fit and everyone else was visibly shaken. I decided that it was time to leave at that point. It was about 9.30pm and while pizza would have been very tempting, I was not hungry in the slightest anymore after that. I thanked them for ordering a pizza, even though I wasn't going to have any, and they wholeheartedly understood I wished my other cousin a happy birthday and told him not to spoil the new Fire Emblem game for me and I just went home. I couldn't sleep at all last night though and I didn't even turn off my light. I was a tired mess at work today and I'm still fearful of going to bed tonight. I texted my cousin a few times today and this evening too and she said that the burning smell didn't go away until around 4am. And no one slept there last night either and are looking into getting some kind of help so that they can feel less terrified about their home. I feel terrible for them honestly and worse for my young cousin who has been actually seeing this screaming lady in her bedroom. And I haven't been able to get the smells coming from her room out of my head. I also have been getting hints of them on and off as my day has gone on and I'm hoping that it's just a residual smell memory and not something more ominous. I still don't think I want to try and sleep tonight, especially not with the light off. It was just such a crazy and scary experience and I knew that I needed to share it with you guys. I have never experienced something like this in my life ever. I've had some spooky things happen over the years in the homes that I've lived in, sure, and maybe a few weird things in another family member's home or a friend's place or whatever, but nothing to the point where I've been this terrified. I really hope my cousin and her family can figure out the situation and make their home somewhere that they feel safe again. Do you guys have any advice that I could give them in order to guide them along the correct path in seeking help? Have you ever felt like someone was watching you? Or worse, have you ever not expected someone to be a spirit as you've just seen them in plain sight? Well, this story starts basically since I was 11 and lasts through the years till I was about 20 or 21. Of course, not completely consistent, but I think there were multiple spirits, as I believe my apartment was just a catalyst for energy. I lived across from a graveyard, so it was no shock that I saw things when I was still a kid. The first memory I have was when I was 11. Life was okay, but plenty of trauma had happened a couple of years prior, so I was vulnerable and open-minded as I wanted to escape my reality. But little did I know that these people or spirits would not be shy with me at all. Some of them were of being attacked to somewhere I was being violent or witnessing a murder. I was so young too that I didn't really think of it as just dreams. But anyway. My first memory was when my mum's boyfriend had stayed the night. I was so excited because I felt protected and I didn't want to stay in my room. I was always scared of this particular corner that you turned to face my bed too. 
I don't know why too, but I just felt like people would peek at me during the night. So this night was great. Like, I was sleeping in the living room and my mum's boyfriend offered to watch TV with me, but he fell asleep as well. And I remember waking up to his obnoxious snoring and I was like, well, crap. It was dark. The hallway was much darker. My living room is right next to my room, but you have to turn the corner to face where I was sleeping. And anyway, I think people could probably have a good idea of what happens next. It was probably about two or three. You know, the usual. I was watching that corner. With all my might, my heart was pounding and I was trying to face my fear. People tell you to be brave when you're 11 and close your eyes, but for some reason I just couldn't. And all of a sudden, these really pale green fingers start to literally wrap themselves over the corner of the doorframe. I'm honestly getting goosebumps even just thinking about it. It was a hand, but the fingers were just so, so long. They wrapped the entire doorframe, in fact. And it looked like a baggy cloak-like sleeve, but burlap was attached to it. I don't even know, but then they vanished, and anyway, that was pretty much the end of that encounter, so the next one happened a couple of years later. I remember this night like it was yesterday. It's a chilling one to think about, too. I remember having awful dreams and waking up to a scream in the middle of the night. My eyes opened wide as I was stuck in a position and I was remembering the dream a minute after and then started to get just cold sweats from fear. I had a dream that there was a white humanoid, very terrifying creature crouched in my closet and it just had the worst smile like it just had bad intentions. As I was recalling this, like I'm reliving it, I was so paralyzed with fear that all I can remember was just tears. Tears and tears until I could pull the blankets over my head. I fell asleep like that because, well, you know, screw it. But it doesn't end here. I was in high school having the whole depression thing going on. I was the only gay guy in my whole school and I wasn't doing so hot. I always had the arts that helped me express emotion though and I hadn't had any ghostly things or night terrors going on at this point. One day after school, I remember being so fed up and I just went into my room. I was being bullied and I felt so isolated and I was tearing up and not sad tears but tears of frustration, lonely and empty ones. I was kneeling near my closet after I had a good little cry and all of a sudden I heard a soft woman's voice say, Are you alright? It was so light and breathy and I said yes but softly in case someone came in and thought that I was crazy. But I definitely heard a voice come from the closet that day. Now, cut to me being of clubbing age at like maybe 20, and I really got into my art and started performing in nightlife. I loved costumes and makeup, so, you know, I became a gay clown, other known as a drag queen. But trust me, this relates. But one night, I was practicing my makeup because I had gigs and competitions. My mum was a great supporter, always wanted to see my work when I was done, I was just putting on eyelashes and saw my mum walk past my room into the living room, but she looked funny. It was just her profile that I could see. She was wearing a white nightgown with like that floral lace tie pattern on the collar and it touched the floor. My mum has black hair and I didn't really think anything of it because I was just feeling myself. I wanted to show her so I jumped up and started to walk out of my room. I said, hey mum what do you think? And before I could finish my sentence, I noticed nobody was in the living room. And it was dark besides one little light. So, obviously, that shook me pretty bad. Like, I'd never felt that shocked before. But maybe my mum just went into her room again really quickly. So I went to check on her and show her, and I expected her to be up since the light was on, but she was asleep in bed. And she had Winnie the Pooh pajamas on. Not a nightgown too. And I woke her up though. You better believe that. I said, were you just in the living room? And she, obviously, had been sleeping. I had trouble getting to bed that night. I mean, to see something like that in the flesh, just like a person walk past my room and I didn't even second guess it. Whatever these things are, they're smart and know when they can and can't show themselves. 
I haven't seen that lady since, but it was definitely not my mum. And I hoped that the apartment was haunted and not me. I lived alone on the fourth floor of an on-campus apartment building when I was in college. Early one morning, around 3am, I was awakened by a knock at my door. I got up, half asleep, and went to the door and peeked at the peephole. And a large guy was standing on the side of my door. I lived in the building for a while and knew my neighbours, but this guy was unfamiliar to me. I didn't open the door, but called out to the guy in the hall. What do you want? Can I help you? Yeah, uh, I need to use your phone, he answered. It's 3am, I told him. I know, but my car is broke down outside. I need to use your phone, the guy said. I was still bleary-eyed and foggy-headed, but something just seemed weird about this whole thing, so I refused to open the door. The guy got frustrated, saying that he was in need and I was not being neighborly or something. I still refused to open the door, and he proceeded to call me some choice names. Finally, after repeated refusals to open the door, he left and I just went back to bed. I honestly didn't think much of it until the next day when I was sitting in class going over the whole event in my head. It struck me as just very odd that this guy would choose my apartment to go to and ask for help. After all, I lived on the fourth floor in the middle of the hall. He didn't knock on any of the other doors, just mine. When he left my apartment, he didn't try any of my neighbors. He just left the building. I realized at that moment that... He had likely targeted me. If I had lived on the first floor near the doors, I might have let it go, but on the fourth? I mean, he had gone up four flights of stairs and halfway down the hall just to ask to use my phone? Right. The thought put a cold lump in my stomach, though, especially when I remembered that there was actually a payphone in the lobby of the building. Even now I get chills whenever I think about that night and what might have happened if I had actually opened my door. I actually started doing that too a couple of times because I was a naive moron who always needed to be liked when I was that age. Fortunately for me, my gut instinct won out that night and I'm here to tell the tale. To preface this story, I've always been wary of this house. A couple of friends and I had actually broken into it before this family bought it and poked around. The stairs leading to the second story are on the far right side of the house, just inside of the front door. They lead to an open loft with a little divider to a smaller sitting area and a short hallway with a door on the side leading to a bathroom and then on the back leading to the bedroom on the far side of the house. That bedroom was situated directly over the master bedroom downstairs which would become his mother's bedroom. In the loft area, just on the other side of the banister, is a small door that leads to the attic. I always got an uneasy feeling around it, even well after they moved in. So, I'll list a few things that led up to this final encounter too. So every night, sometime around 2 or 3, the attic door would open. My friend would often sleep on the sofa in the loft area, and there was a light on just inside the attic door that splashed light across his face waking him up. When he was in his bedroom, the sound of the door slowly creaking open would often wake him up too. And it was always standing open in the morning too. One day, when he was downstairs in the kitchen, he saw a small white thing that he described as probably a foot and a half tall, white humanoid in his peripheral vision. When he looked over at it, it ran into the front room by the door. He didn't go looking for it, but his mother would later tell him that his father had seen the exact same thing and ran after it. He threw the couch to the side thinking that it was hidden behind it, but it was gone. There were no other exits in the room too. One day, his mother had a friend over and they played church music and prayed. It turns out that her room had all kinds of crazy stuff happening in it. Noises mostly, but the clothes in the closet would sway back and forth randomly too. That's probably what the praying was about. Because you see, my friend didn't want to tell his parents about what he was seeing. Because he assumed that they'd think that he was on drugs or something. His father didn't live with them and confided in his mother much later, but mostly he didn't experience much until well after they'd been living there. 
The mother didn't tell the others about her problems because she had finally found a good home for her kids and didn't want to scare them. So the praying starts, one assumes as a way to cleanse the house or something, or find some kind of divine protection. I don't really know, but that's what makes sense to me given all the facts. But anyhow, right as they begin praying, the music stops and loud footsteps stomp across the second story leading to the bedroom and then the door slams incredibly loudly. The mother's friend left the house and she called the father from her car and after that she was never in the house alone again. Soon after she had to leave the house but didn't know her sons were seeing stuff too. She took the younger son with her but offered to let the older son keep the house for free and as a 19 year old he was like hell yeah despite the attic door being weird. Fast forward a year or so and various things led him to invite a lot of people to stay with him rent free. Eventually though, all would leave for different reasons and one night he found himself in the house alone again. And sometime around 3am he would be banging on our door begging to let him stay with us. That was over 20 years ago and this is what he told me yesterday about that night. So he was now sleeping in the master bedroom, his mum's old room. He had been experiencing the noises and the swinging clothes and basically had just tried to ignore it. But that night, he heard the bedroom door open upstairs. Then, loud footsteps moved slowly towards the stairs. At this point, he thought someone might have broken in and was trying to figure out what to do. Whoever it was had stopped at the top of the stairs from what he could tell. So the front door was out. He said that he just considered making a run for the back door and he heard the stairs start to creak one by one like someone was walking down them and he basically froze. His bedroom door was open so he could see down the hall but not the stairs themselves and the next thing he knows there's a dark smoky presence in the hallway. Mostly formless, it moved towards the room along the wall momentarily disappearing to the right of the door and then next, a set of what he described as talons, like from a giant eagle, grasp the doorframe, then a second set below them. Then, a head appears, all smoky but almost white, with pure black where the eye should be. He said that when it saw him, it visibly frowned and he jumped through the window to get away. I can verify the timing, and that he was indeed very scared. His window was broken out too and his bushes were all jacked up where he'd pushed through them. But quite frankly, I've never heard of anything like what he said that he saw before. Does anyone have any ideas? This story happened years ago when I was six or seven, maybe eight I think. So my mum and dad went to go visit family for a reunion I think. It was located at a beachside park and there was a playground nearby. It was a fun day with swimming and barbecues but the day was coming to a close. My parents were chatting with the other adults and I went to the playground because well, I was bored. I didn't think to tell my parents too because I was a dumbass at that age. I assumed they'd seen me so it was fine right? As I was playing, a couple approached the playground. They were both Caucasian, with the lady having wavy red hair and some blemishes. She wore a faded overcoat and boots. The man was much taller than her and he had a bald head and was wearing a blue tracksuit. They both looked like middle-aged parents in their late 40s or something. I didn't care about them until they walked up to me. They then waved at me and said hi, so I said hi back. I didn't come down from the playset, but then they asked me... Hey, where are your friends? Me, being stupid, said that I didn't come with any and just came with my relatives. I pointed in the direction of the beach. They went far enough that I couldn't see them, probably a hundred feet or so away. The couple then tried to make small talk about stuff I liked, where I lived, my home phone number, all red flags that I'd run from today, but I was blind to them back then. Thank whoever's out there too that I didn't remember my home phone or address back then and only answered questions about the things that I liked. I started coming down the playset too when the lady of the couple asked that question. The question that I'll always remember. We can be your friends you know. Don't you want a friend who'll never let you go? My response wasn't the most normal to the question and instead of screaming for help 
I hopped down the other side of the playset towards my parents and called for them to come over. I believe I called out, Mama, Papa, look, I made some new friends. Now, for the past seven or so minutes, I guess, my parents and relatives were looking for me frantically since I'd wandered off. When I called for my parents, my mum heard and started to run over. I'm guessing that she saw the couple. The couple looked at each other for half a second, realized my dumbass was not worth it, and just ran off towards the parking lot. My mum then came to me and gave me a big hug. She then asked what happened and I told her about the friends that I'd made, what we talked about, and how I was sad that they ran off. My mum just sighed and called the cops and my mum told them about what happened and they asked me what the couple looked like. Being a kid at the time, my descriptions were vague and basic. The cops left and we decided to pack up and then just drive home. On the way home, my mum gave the stranger danger talk to me and this time, I actually listened. I don't know if they were ever caught. I hope they were, for the sake of dumb kids everywhere like me. Or that at least, this deterred them from nabbing kids ever again. Because they were almost caught. I'm really not sure where to start with this because there's just so much that has happened. I'll try and clarify as best as I can without making this too long, but I should first say that I've always been sensitive to these kinds of things, so it's something that's hard to explain without sounding, well, absolutely crazy. I picked up on things sometimes. It's only ever a feeling or a physical response to a place or a person. There is a long history of abuse over many generations in my family's home and it caused a lot of really horrible experiences, both paranormal and non-paranormal too. It was just a very old-fashioned family that held horrid ideals of how women are treated. I think a part of my past and maybe the environment has allowed me to pick up on subtle changes in the air too. But what I mean is that I pick up on the emotional state around me very easy. I could just tell when my father came home because of how heavy and oppressive the house felt. I could tell when I needed to hide or stay outside most of the time because it would feel like the air was full of well, hot electric pins maybe that would just put you on edge. You could tell when he was mad before you even saw or heard him. It was like you're waiting for something to fall and shatter at any second, and nothing good will come of it. There was a lot of death, and not just in the home, but the entire town, so there was no getting away from it until I was much older. So I grew up in an old mining town that didn't become a ghost town after the gold rush. I'm not going to give away too much, but the big mine is still in operation today, but most of all the others are now closed. The part of the town that I lived in was one of the original buildings from when it was first built, a lot of which is in native territories too. There are some homes in my old neighborhood that are confirmed to be built on old burial grounds and some that are built before there was a town even. There was also a lot of death from TB along with all the other stuff. My family is also part of some of the first miners that worked there during its open and who still live in this town. We have had five generations in this home until just recently, when it was put on the market by my parents and, hopefully, is never bought. Honestly, I hope the place burns to the ground before anyone else lives there, and I'm horrified at the thought of someone else staying there. If I had the money, I would buy it and keep it empty forever. Like I said, it's hard to start somewhere with just so much going on, so I'll start with the very first memory that I have of anything paranormal when I was four years old. I woke up to a woman in my room singing to me like she did every night. She would sing to me in this beautiful language that I had never heard before. Except this was in the morning and it seemed sad and like something was wrong. For some reason, I had this feeling like I had to follow her and I did. Side note too, all the rooms connect to the open living room or kitchen as it was heated by the stove and cooled by the root cellar that was connected to the kitchen pantry. It was like a giant rectangle separated from the central point being the kitchen directly in the center left of the building and the front door being bottom left. So when we reached the kitchen living room, she waved and smiled like she was about to leave. The thing is too is that I thought that she was as real as any normal person. I don't remember her actually saying anything to me in English or Spanish. I was in a multi-language home and we spoke it often. I just remember that she loved me so much and was always there for me when bad things happened. 
She was always there to see me to sleep and was there when I was scared. I was so upset that I started crying and asked her not to leave. I remember to this day the look on her face after 30 years too. She smiled her sad smile and then turned to the door and instead of walking out of the door, she just walked out the wall where the door used to be before the additional rooms were added on, which I didn't know about until I was in my 20s. I never did see her again and I never heard her again singing after that too. I still get really sad sometimes thinking about that morning. I don't know where she went but I hope that I get to see her again someday. My mother found me after a while. I was still crying. I knew that it would be bad to tell her the truth so I never told her about what happened and probably never will. But it was after that day when all the really bad things just started to happen little by little. It was like a small hole that appeared in our home and slowly things were just leaking through. My uncle became so very sick shortly after this and died in one of the rooms that I slept in. We switched rooms every few years. I was still young but I remember him very clearly when he died. It was a very traumatic death and was not peaceful. I don't remember everything from that time but I remember him coughing up blood and trying to pretend like everything was fine. I just remember that I woke up one morning and grandma had told me that he had passed in the night and was already with the morticians. After this point, he was seen a lot by family and visitors too. Grandma was heard on more than one occasion crying and telling him to move on and that he was supposed to be in heaven. I remember her telling him, you'll make the angels cry if you don't move on, on a regular basis. Maybe a few months after he passed, I moved into his room and we were very, very poor, so I had no choice but to take the bed that he passed in or sleep on the floor, and that's very bad because of the cold. So the first night I was in there after moving back, I remember not being able to sleep because of the shadow in the room that just wouldn't let me sleep. It wasn't supposed to be there and was something new that I was really scared about. It wasn't my uncle and I at some point finally fell asleep and was woken by me being dropped onto my bed from at least a foot or more. It was enough of a height that I bounced more than once. I opened my eyes and saw this black stuff just all around me. It wasn't like smoke, but moved exactly like it. But it was just black, like the absence of light. I remember jumping from the bed, too scared to do anything, but watch it disappear into the center of my mattress. I went and slept with my brother in his cot and then on the floor in his room when he became too big. I never slept in that room again after that and from then on I could always feel this evil darkness watching me every time I walked past that room. I could never look into the doorway anymore. It's like when someone is just so oppressive that you can't help but look at the floor and don't dare look them in the eyes. It sometimes felt like it would dare you to look even. Sometimes it threw things and it would rush you and scream things. There were many nights where dishes were thrown from the kitchen and into a room, sometimes mine and sometimes the other kids' rooms. Only grandma's room and the bathroom had doors, so it soon became a rule that nothing could be left on the countertops and all cupboards were locked with front door latches, the ones that would hook and latch closed and could not be opened without a bit of effort. The fridge was also locked for some reason, we would wake up to milk or other things being thrown into the living rooms and in the bedrooms. It got so bad, in fact, that Grandma had the priest come over every weekend up until she was too old and sick and was taken to a nursing facility. When he stopped coming and Grandma passed, it was like a dam burst and everything just went completely crazy. Now, I'm not religious at all, but I feel that that priest was stopping something really bad that now had full control again. There were far more things being broken, vases and cups mostly, and when he stopped coming, it seemed like there was just more traffic, and it surrounded the cellar and the kitchen pantry. This is getting long, and there's still so much more that I haven't even touched on. I'll post later and try to tell one or two more stories at a time. I'll answer as many questions as you guys have in the comment section, and thank you guys for listening. It's hard talking about this because, well, I know that none of it seems real. But there was a lot that happened there, and some of it I don't think I'll ever be able to talk about because there's just some things that you can't put into words. Everything sounds fake, even to me, but had there not been so many witnesses in my family, 
I wouldn't believe it was real and that I was just crazy or was having hallucinations or something like that. I'll stop here for the night, but I'll be back. The building that I used to work in had two security guards, a harmless old guy and a younger guy my age who was not so harmless. Over time, he became friendly and he asked me on a date. I said yes. I had already mentioned that I was moving out of country soon, so obviously nothing will come of it, but hey, if he wants to come and buy me dinner, why not? Mistake one, though, was giving him my address to pick me up. I mean, he's security at work and I'm leaving the country soon, so it all seemed like a small risk. I told office mates that I agreed to dinner with him. I mean, what's the worst that can happen? He arrives on time with two dozen roses. He then tells me that he's bought a brand new suit and had his car detailed for the occasion. Yeah, it was a bit much, but so far he seems nice and harmless. So I thank him, say that I forgot something, and I'll be right back. I wasn't about to let him in to put the roses in water or anything. But we get to dinner at a very nice restaurant. We've not even had our drink order taken, and he drops this on me. He is a 27-year-old virgin who has never even kissed anyone. This is his first date, and he's super nervous. And I mean, really, dude? You know who else is really nervous now? This chick here. What am I supposed to do with that nugget of info? So, needless to say, dinner was very awkward. I did my best to be polite and kind, but it just got weirder. At the end of the night, he lunged for my face and stuck his tongue in and out of my mouth. I was not expecting that. But hey, he's now kissed a real live girl and had his first date, so good for him, I suppose. Not looking forward to breaking it to him later that I'm really not interested and also moving. But why rain on his parade then? But before I could break it to him, it got really weird. Like, how dare you not return my call the next day or the day after. And not that it's his business, but I spent that Saturday and Sunday visiting family. I come home to a full box of voice messages, the last of which was angry. And when I got to work on Monday, I found a lovely letter at my desk. It basically said that he knew where I lived, what car I drove, and some other info showing that he'd been taking notes of my coming and going. Why wasn't I home that weekend and whatnot? Which, obviously, was pretty creepy. And this is why you're single, dude. He got angry and stalkery. I'd see him out on occasion when I wasn't working, and in the end I just said screw this and gave early notice and I just got the heck out of there. I wish that I could tell you too that moving country was enough. But no. He somehow found me online. I don't use my real name because of work, but he proceeded to harass me online, followed friends to find me and whatnot, and the dude is acting really aggressive. I hope that I can shake this guy soon because this seems to be taking a turn for the worse. In 2012, I was just a regular college kid. I'd had a couple of paranormal experiences, but despite this, I had a skeptical attitude toward the paranormal. But then I found out that I was pregnant. Well, my boyfriend and I decided to get married and started looking for a place to live. Amazingly, we found a duplex just a block from my parents' house that allowed dogs and was super cheap. If you've ever watched a haunting, then you probably know where this is going. But at the time, we were just relieved to find a place that we could afford. The only strange thing was how many people had quickly moved in and out of this particular unit, while the same guy had lived downstairs for over a decade. We had only lived there for a couple of weeks when I asked my husband if he'd moved something of mine. When he said no, I jokingly said, maybe we have a ghost. And my husband froze. I asked him what was wrong, and he said that he hadn't wanted to scare me, but the other night, while we were getting down and dirty, he looked up to see what looked like a man standing in the other room. He said that he'd gotten up to find no one there. I was a little creeped out by this, but since I hadn't seen anything, I told myself that it was all in his head. The next few months were busy with getting ready for the baby, and we didn't notice any activity. 
In October, our son was born and we were too busy adjusting to parenthood to think about ghosts. My iPod went missing, but we assumed that it had just been stolen. On Christmas morning, I put the baby on our bed and went to help my husband with breakfast. We heard the baby cry and both rushed back in to check on him. He was an extremely fussy baby who never stopped crying on his own. So we were shocked when he suddenly just stopped crying. We were both standing in the doorway and watched in awe as we saw him interacting with something that we couldn't see. He was looking at something and then started laughing and reaching toward it. We watched this go on for a couple of minutes too. Around this same time, we had to get a new mattress. When we took the old one off, we found my stolen iPod in the middle of the box spring. I still can't think of any explanation for how it even got there. Weird things started happening more often after this too. I became terrified to be home alone because once while I was home alone I was sitting in the living room when a rock was thrown at me and now I checked everywhere but I swear to you that there was nobody there. Once my ghostly hand reached around the door frame too. As my son got older he started to talk about someone named Boo as well. Someone even asked him who he lived with and he replied Mama, Daddy, Papa and Boo. Sometimes I'd even see him try to hand toys to someone that I couldn't see and then get upset when the toys fell to the ground. On one occasion, I was giving him a bath and he looked up and excitedly exclaimed, Boo, while pointing up. I stood up, trying to see what he was pointing at, only to find nothing but a pocket of cold ice air in the otherwise steamy bathroom. Things would constantly go missing too in that house, only to show up in places that we'd already looked. It drives us crazy and added to our already strained relationship. We started to argue constantly and my husband became paranoid and accused me of all sorts of things. This house had a basement too and we kept our washer and dryer down there. It always creeped me out so I liked to have our dog keep me company when I did the laundry. And one night I was putting clothes in the dryer when I heard my dog growl. I looked up to see him growling at the dark corner of the basement when... All of a sudden, he was knocked backwards and yelps. He gets up and runs, whimpering up the stairs, and I ran after him. My son and I moved out of that house when my husband and I decided to get divorced. Thankfully, we haven't experienced any paranormal activity where we live now. Interestingly though, after my ex moved out of that house, our relationship just improved a lot. We went from barely speaking to now being friends and successfully co-parenting. I still scratch my head at some of the things that happened in that house, but I'm sure glad that we're no longer living there.